John, Neve, are you ready to accept this podcast into your life? I've never been more ready. I'm not just saying that. Neve? My mouth's open. <laughs> Do you know what? Um, I can remember like going to mass as a kid, and <laughs> you you would you would see the priest, and he'd be offering communion, and all the people would be lined up. But some people would like be really into like maybe just doing like a gentle lick of the priest, <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, like 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 index finger and thumb oh. as he's handing them holy communion, and they kind of do like a like a. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they they put their tongue out. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'd love to do that and then get a little like <laughs> <laughs> just like a little nip. Yeah. I only ever got it in my hand. I don't I don't want that. I just it's so funny when people like pop out their tongue like a little like register, like Put it on. Yeah. Pop it in there now in my tongue. Mm-hmm. Oh I'd love to accept holy communion. Janie Mackers, tis yourself. <laughs> That's pretty good, Brian. Thanks. It's uh, based on personal experience. Oh, based on a lot of personal experience. You, 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 you grow up in Ireland, you grow up... My, my parents weren't even Catholic, and somehow I grew up Catholic. You got the spirit in you. I got the spirit in me. I got the spirit all over me. Welcome the let's fight a boss video blame podcast whoa that's interesting that's what it is yeah yeah um we don't like video games we just kind of blame them for stuff uh just very specific targeted anger mm-hmm. at, 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 at a computer game yeah totally for children uh, i am your host andrew hard fight to my right it's Samantha finger going bang bang and to my left it's Oliver St. Jeremy the fourth <laughs> the fourth the fourth I am the Mac Daddy of swag yep I'm sponsored by so many different vape companies so many different vape companies wow I'm sponsored by guns <laughs> really? nice just guns.tm you know what sponsors me what freedom Really can't beat that one. no you yeah. can't beat that you, can't, you literally can't it's impossible yeah fuck freedom it's a valuable asset hang on I gotta say this or people aren't gonna get their dopamine hit welcome to the world's strongest video game podcast I am sitting here to my left with Brian hello to my right Neve. hello and with you always your host John that was like really that, like normal then. That was yeah. great. That was like, I, 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 look. I, I've been I fucked around with the intro enough. This is what happens when we miss a week. We're kind of weirdly out of practice. Like that was the fastest cold open. That was the weirdest. <laughs> There's a naming. lot on the docket as well. Yeah, so yeah, like, yeah. We got we, 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 we got a lot to get shit. to. This is gonna. This is this is strapping your butts, everyone. This is. We're not, we're not, we're not quitting before and two hour 40 is my prediction. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I'd say we'll be wrapping up at midnight. That's fine. How many hours of Let's Fight a Boss are there? Ooh, I did a really like bad maths equation because I was trying to figure out how many hours someone may have listened to me, but I don't know them. And I got two, three hundred and I stopped counting. So definitely over 300. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's maths. quite a lot. That's quite a lot. If you think of how long it would take. Think of how many days you'd have to be around someone, like, in normal everyday life to accumulate that much knowledge about them. Fucking terrifying. Okay, so from episodes, I'm going to ask, put it out there, from episodes 30 to present, which is what's more or less published out there, Mm -hmm. what's the number? What is that total? Not including the black tapes, which is on patreon.com forward slash LFB. Patreon.com forward slash You can LFB. listen to the first 30 episodes where we just yeah. fucked up so bad. You can pay us money to listen to by far the worst content we've ever produced. <laughs> We're all For some babies. reason, I think I think we should we should flip it. We should take everything offline except <laughs> the first 30 episodes. Just hold that hostage. Yeah, and so if you want the good shit, if if you want now, you got to pay up. That's really good. Yeah, that's a really good idea. All we need is 1000 true fans and they will just do anything. <laughs> Oh dear, dear oh dear, guys, we got a lot to get through. So let's let's. I say let's begin. Okay. Okay. 
I don't know what to start with. Brian, what would you like to start with? Uh, God, we're re- we really need. We really are off our game. Yeah, aren't I know. We? Yeah. yeah. Okay, John, what is the Ringmaster? Is that related? oh boy? Okay, yeah, I'm I'm happy to talk about this. Okay, the Ringmaster is a 2019 documentary, I think, and it is on the subject of onion rings. Huh. <laughs> that could have been like like three things, and mm-hmm. it's not the one I would have guessed ever. Yeah. Specifically, a man named Larry Lang, who is very, very good at making onion rings. Like, everyone who tastes these onion rings are like, holy sh- I don't even like onion rings. It's really hard to cook onion rings because they need to be, like, the perfect temperature, uh, perfect time. It's a really hard thing to balance. He watched the documentary, Brian. I think he knows. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> he might not. It might not have come up in this uh, craft of onion rings. In stuff. fairness to Brian, the median level of difficulty of cooking an onion ring wasn't really explored very thoroughly. So what is this documentary this about? This is a documentary John? about Larry Lang, the like... ring king. Okay. Uh, I don't think they actually call him that in the... Is he the ringmaster? Um, I'm pretty definite someone says that at some point. But it's basically, he's this very simple little American man... He wears a blue shirt and an apron, also pants, just to complete the visual picture there. Does he wear a hat? No um, shoes. No, he's balding and he has little little socks and little shoes, Neve. And um, every day he comes in with his little cotton bag yeah. and that's full of his secret ingredients um, to make the best onion rings ever. I can tell you for sure that one of the ingredients is definitely onions. Okay. Is there a weird ingredient? No one knows. So you watch the full documentary and you don't even know this guy's secret recipe? That was not the purpose of the... In fact, I'm sure waivers were signed explicitly to make that not the purpose. Are the onion rings batter or breadcrumb? Were they smooth or did they have a texture? They had a texture, but I think they were were deep fried. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think breadcrumb. I think breadcrumb. Okay. And they were also not what you'd... They're not quite... They're not very ringular... Were they like discs? <laughs> they they were kind of like they look nearly like pasta, and you pick them up and put them in your mouth. That's then it's not even a ring. Yeah, it uh, sounds it, like it, an onion yeah, badge. It, 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 like, it, 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 it is. It is. It is. No, it's 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 a ring. I think they just fall apart really easily. So a bad ring, guys. I feel like this guy sucks. At his job. <laughs> <laughs> if what the fuck's he doing in his life? Where's my documentary? How dare you? <laughs> How dare you both? He's a really. This guy is like an. I don't mean this in a bad way. He's a really simple guy. Really, really simple. He makes onion rings. He has no other discernible traits as depicted by this documentary. That's all he likes to do. He comes into his job, which is a restaurant owned by two other people, a married couple. He cooks their onion rings. Their onion rings are famous. People come to the restaurant to buy their onion rings. And this documentary crew starts making a film about Larry because the guy making the documentary... He used to love Larry's onion rings when he was little. And he was like, oh, more people should know about these. And the documentary kind of keeps going. And Larry looks like noticeably uncomfortable in front of the camera. Like the guy would be like, um, so tell us, like, what what are some of your like childhood memories? And Larry's like, oh, uh, 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 I don't know. Like, uh, like you mean, you mean like something from, from my childhood? And the guy's like, yeah, yeah, just, you know, whatever. And Larry's like, yeah, um, yeah, probably something like that. (laughs) (laughs) And it's just, you can tell Larry, it's not just that he doesn't want to be on the documentary. I don't think he really understands what a documentary is. Mm -hmm. This is like, this is like, and it's not an intelligent thing. It's not a like mental capacity thing. This is like a, I think like an old country thing. I presume if this guy's whole life is onion rings, the idea that someone wants to document him is probably really, really weird. Yeah. Yeah, because to him it's not, it's just his routine. But the thing is, the guy making the documentary, he's a former gambling addict, just recovered. And at some point, it starts to become apparent that he is replacing his gambling addiction with making this documentary and he's just spending a weird amount of money on it like whenever he needs to fly anyone anywhere he flies them first class and it just becomes this really strange but it's a problem because there's not really a story here larry is you know like he's 
He is the same way he was 30 years ago, the same way he will be in 30 years. He doesn't have an arc. Yeah, exactly. And you start to see the film, the documentary maker really start to freak out about this. And he's like, I put so much money into this fucking documentary. And, you know, and so he becomes obsessed with giving Larry the perfect ending. But Larry doesn't want an ending. He wants to make rings. But Neve, what if he was famous? I don't think Larry wants that. Larry does not want that. No. The documentary maker doesn't seem to understand that. It's such a and weird so, warped view that fame is a goal for everyone. Yeah. And then Larry's sister is also this like woman, this like older kind of American woman with aspirations to be an actor and the spotlight and all that kind of okay. stuff. Okay. So she's pushing Larry into all this. And it le- and they're weirdly well connected, the both of them. So it leads to these really strange situations where like like Gene Simmons is in the documentary because he owns like this this car derby thing in America. I think oh, him yeah, he and does. Ki- yeah. And they want to make Larry the official food of that derby. And like, there's literally a bit where he's like, Gene, the Gene Simmons manager is there and he's like, um, Larry, here's a check. Why don't you tell me how much that's for? And Larry's like, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I make about $500 a week at the restaurant. And he's like, yeah, Larry, I know, I know, I know. Here's the check. Open the check. And Larry's like looking at it and he just didn't say anything. He goes, that's right, $17,000. And Larry looks at him and he goes, oh, uh, I don't know if I can take this. I can't, I can't miss work this weekend. Larry's mind does not really operate outside the confines of his his very humble very pleasant existence he needs a simple life he just wants to make his rings he just wants to make his rings and they keep pushing and pushing and pushing and it is such a tense documentary so sometimes sometimes when I'm doing a video I'll come to this horrible point right at the end where I'm like I don't fucking know what I was trying to say with this video I don't know why I decided to make this like I'm gonna put this video out and it's gonna be a fucking disaster this movie is an hour and a half of that slowly destroying a very simple, very nice little man's life. And the end scene, Larry is put in a very big make it or break it moment. He does not want to be there. It is very unpleasant to watch. And it's just what happens when you think you're doing right by someone else, but you're not actually thinking about what they want. You're thinking about what you think they should want. Mm -hmm. If Uh, I was Larry, I'd want to be famous for my rings. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And um, it's sad because like the people who own the hotel then are like, you're trying to steal Larry from us. And it's like, well, now hang on. That's not right either. You can't steal him, you know? And um, a re Oh, the people making the documentary, they're 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 called the cap bros and they all have caps that say cap bros oh, that's oh. cool but the, I, I, I think they're actual brothers i'm not sure but um they start basically all the cap bros turn against the head cap bro and they're like we have to start making this documentary about his descent into madness because there's nothing happening with larry and then there's like there's all this drama between them and the director is like and then you know what he did he did the worst thing he could possibly do he gave me back the Capro cap. That means it's not a Capro anymore. Yeah. This is a fascinating little movie. It's an hour and a half. It really, really made me reflect on some things. Is Larry okay? <laughs> okay. It's a... Uh... It's not the cheeriest movie. Just So, like, if you're listening to all this and you're thinking... Oh, maybe maybe Larry really pulls it out of the bag in the final hour. I just want to confirm that probably does not happen. Does Larry get out of the situation at least? Oh, yeah. Okay, that's good. It's not his problem. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, no. If I was Larry, I'd just turn off my phone and disappear into the night. Oh, Neve, you think Larry has a phone? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's got onion rings. Um, but like, it's 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 was a really fascinating watch, and just 
it was the kind of thing I wanted to watch it like for half an hour before I went mm. to bed and then I, I just watched it all because I was like this is horrifying I wonder if it's a thing now where those onion rings are now even more famous so people come to try and get them I think because I've not seen them but I want to eat onion rings now and yeah. I'm hungry it really made me want to eat onion rings I love onion rings I don't think Larry is going to make me onion rings oh <laughs> that could mean a couple of different things I'm going to let people find out for themselves People are the real nightmare. Who knew? Who knew? Turns out we were the real monster all along. If you like something and enough people like it, it's a bad thing. Real quick, I'm just going to talk about Smiling Friends. Oh, yes. Uh, Smiling Friends is an adult swim animation, and it's kind of like if you left Adventure Time out in the sun. (laughs) It is. Um... (laughs) It's such a strange show. It's such a strange show. It's it it has real like super jail weird energy to it, but it's more it's more depressed than super jail and more grounded. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. It it feels like a continuation of super jail in that it's a cartoon ass cartoon, but it's an adult animation. Yeah, a, a uh, lot of a lot of like small, very ugly cartoon characters having awkward conversations with each other, but it's. I, it, I I think like there's definitely a kind of person who turns this on and in five minutes is like fuck this I hate it and um, I loved it Michelle really loved it and it's 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 weird it's about these two characters and they're the smiling friends and it's their job to go around to different like people and organizations and like make them smile again and I think like it's such a good premise it's such a good premise and the show's like overall tone is just like the complete grimness and futility of that like the first episode is them trying to oh that poor kid duncan ain't doing so good no he's not doing so good and the first episode is about them trying to cheer up like a cancelled tv presenter who's just an absolute nightmare oh that's the frog one yeah Yeah. the frog the the frog episode's really good it's so good and um there's a part where the frowning friends are introduced and well they were my favorite they were i i would be a member of the frowning friends for sure um, not a whole lot to say about it other than just I thought it ruled and if if people are into that kind of humor totally check it out guys we all watched You Are Not My Mother yes this is uh, an Irish horror film uh, that came out recently mm-hmm. last episode or maybe the episode previous we were trying to like come up with like good examples of Irish media that like resemble a, a, a fairly acrid version of Ireland or you know do Ireland justice I thought you were not my mother did that. There is yeah. what I call like a, a Dublin hell to this movie. Absolutely. This is a, this is a, a low budget Irish horror film that uses its uh, means to huge effectiveness, I mm-hmm. guess. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, totally. Um, it's about a girl called Shar and she's in secondary school. Not sure what year. She's probably around 16 or something. Yeah. And it kind of opens and she's late for school. So she asks her granny to take her to school. And her granny is like, my leg's gammy. You got to ask your mom. And her mom is, has the telltale signs of depression. She's, she's stuck in bed and it's Shara just trying to kind of wake her mom up and be like, mom, we, I need to be brought to school and asking her mom in the car, you know, could you get some shopping while her mom has that very specific depression thousand yard stare yeah she's really checked out and the mom is just like why do i need to go to the shop and shara's just like there's no food in the house so things aren't looking good for Shar. it's a she's she's in a situation where she has like a single parent living with her granny and her mom is just like madly depressed and it has all like it has all the hallmarks of a depression horror which like it totally is until mm-hmm. the moment it isn't and it brings in Irish folklore. Yes. Uh, Mom goes missing, presumed uh, not to be alive, unfortunately. Yeah, they find her car empty. Yeah. Then she returns, but her behavior is very erratic. and She's better now. Yeah, she's better. But there's a lot of problems with her. She's not behaving like a human. There's a middle portion of this movie that's really reminiscent of um, Goodnight Mommy. Yeah, for sure. But I think... Aside from the premise, those are really different movies. Yeah, and the daughter knows something's up. Grandma knows. Oh, grandma fucking knows. Because grandma's into paganism, and she knows the fucking bullshit. Yep. And there's also an uncle who kind of 
drifts in and out of the film. Most of the characters, I'd say it's like ninety percent female characters. There's, it, it's like it's I don't one, think like, yes, I, I think it's one dude, right? Yeah, I, I, yeah. Like for ages, it like it, it's not until like half an hour into the movie, like a male character shows up and speaks a line, and I was like, oh, there he is. See, Brian, we're disappearing. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Yeah, she goes to an all-girls school as well. Yeah. And she's been bullied in the school, and the bullying is just spot-on oh bullying. Oh my god, yeah. yeah. Oh. I, I, I really like how the bullying works, is that there's one person who encourages it, and when that person isn't around, the others are kind of more sound to each other. And how one of the bullies is a bully, but then later on she's like actually nice. It's just... Yeah. The, the situation's changed. It's like the, the, the social dynamics of bullying. It's just like two girls there, one of them is going at another one, and then as your one walks off, the other one's kind of a little bit nicer kind of thing. Mm. Or there's just like... You can tell there's one of the bullies who really doesn't want to be doing it. Yeah. And like, she's not even a major character, but she's mm-hmm. just like, ah, lads. And it's like, that's that's interesting. Yeah, absolutely. It, yeah, it, it does the teenage, especially teenage girl angle, very authentically. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was watching it with my girlfriend and she was just like she was like this is very authentic bullying but I'm surprised no one has been called a lesbian yet and then it happened <laughs> and I was just like there we go yeah. <laughs> there's some Irish secondary school bullying I, I, I did like weed girl and how she was a bully and then she turned into just like cool weed girl yeah kind of the saviour at the end of the day yeah it was like it's a real like it's a really slow movie but it has a lot of like it's really like scrumptious when it comes to like like sonically like a lot of sound design in it that really works really strongly there was like this kind of use of like celtic horns in it Mm. that i've never really heard in a horror movie like in this specific way and it was so unnerving i just really i really like the set design of the house and it's those like brown carpets yeah and like the, we, the, we've the, all yeah mm-hmm. been in houses like, like this there's less of those houses now because yeah. they get bought out and refurnished re, re, yeah like like yeah they get revamped but like that is a house that hasn't been updated since like the 50s or 60s and oh, the fucking granny was brilliant the bit where granny does her like little wicker ball and does a spell on it to help her son uh, the the uncle uh, when he's in the hospital and someone comes in and she's like you can't be smoking in here and she's like fuck off that was brilliant <laughs> that was so good <sighs> won me over right away yeah um, um i thought that the mother's acting and just physicality in general was great that bit where she puts on the joe dolan record was so upsetting so that was the high point of the movie for me like there's this bit where she starts dancing with her daughter but then there's another bit later on where she dances at her daughter but then the dancing just starts to get more and more unhinged and fucking weird. And like, after a while, you're not watching a mom dance. You're watching this creature, the shape of a human, just gyrate and smash themselves around. And it, it really reminded me of like one of my favorite um, horror scenes ever. And it's from that movie you watch, Brian. Um, oh, fuck. The really fucked up one with the French girl in the subway station. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I can't think of the head. Yeah, I, I'm... Uh, the one possession, one, possession, possession. Yeah, yeah. yeah that that's that filmed uh, in, uh, in in Germany during the, co- or yeah, while the Berlin Wall is still up. Yeah, but like I think the horror of the human body is an yeah, interesting yeah. thing, especially when it's not playing off like, like, look at how fucked up this person looks. Mm. Like when it's actually done through she's like, like stamping up and down at her ankles, and yeah. then yeah. Oh, it's Jesus. going to the beat until it's not going to the yeah. beat. Um. Without getting into too many spoilers, like the name of the movie is You Are Not My Mother. So that gives you an idea of what is happening to the mother in this. But like, there is some Irish folklore stuff and some really subtle things that I'm only thinking of that that for me, it was like thinking about afterwards. So one right away is that before she goes missing there, it's the mother and the daughter in the car. The mother's driving and they break all of a sudden because there's a horse on the road. I think that horse is a puka. Absolutely. Because it's never explained, and up until that point, you just think it's a stray horse just because of the... uh, You're in the area, there's probably a horse in a field there. But, like, it's never shown again, and that's definitely a puka setting things off. And they have, like, lines later on about how, like, how they try to build on the land, but it's, like, marshy land. And so that means it's definitely, definitely connected to some sort of, like, spirit underworld or demonic Mm -hmm. connection. And, and the it, lead up to Halloween as well. Yeah, it takes place during uh, like Samhain and stuff. And I like when they go you on mean the Samhain. Ah, Samhain. Yeah. And I like when they go on the school tour and they're really like 
she really wants them to engage with the history, <laughs> yeah. and the girls just uh, she was the great. The just school tour was dressed in her shit. autumnal colors. <laughs> yeah, but it was a good way to kind of just get across, like uh, you know, like kind of the basics of Samhain, where it's like the worlds between the living and the the dead, the like the veil is thin kind of thing. And... Yeah, during that month, mm-hmm. um, they're setting it all up. And then like there's other things where where the mum is making dinner and she's not carving the pumpkin, she's cutting it up and putting it into stew because the pumpkin is an American import for Halloween and she wouldn't know what that is because she's old. Like, mm-hmm. like That's she's, interesting, yeah. yeah. She's like 2,000 years old probably. Like like she wouldn't know what that is. And the bit where they try to make her eat a potato, like like she's eating like, she, like these are proper chipper chips. Those chips look so fucking good. She's eating one and I think part of it is that like Potatoes aren't made of the Ireland, they're from South America, but it's also that she can't eat human food. But it, it has this kind of like double meaning that... Yeah, yeah, no, totally, that, that's, that, that, that's really that, cool. That she can't like take in the new customs that are in Ireland because she's yeah. from a different a different era. Yeah. Without getting too heavy into spoilers, like how do you guys feel about the, where the movie went and like its second half and stuff? I really liked it. I like how it brought in the like the folklore stuff and that was all pretty connected to the folklore and yeah, it I was like it was it. nice to see that and i thought it was i thought it was pretty good they they say the name of the movie in like the pivotal <laughs> yeah. moment and like i was just like say the name say the name and it was like that bart simpson mean and mm-hmm. they did it and that was a little corny but i was also like yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know it's... i was a bit torn on that because it was both like you both could tell it was coming a mile away and... so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah when, the know? whole way through me and michelle were watching it and i was like i think i know what's going on here and then michelle's like oh yeah and yeah i was like yeah i think the mom Actually, no, wait, I'm going to, I'll save it. I don't want to spoil the film for you. And then later on, I'd be like, yeah, I think there's something wrong with this mom. I think, I think something's happened. And then I was like, wait, what's this movie called? Actually, no, never mind, never mind. Let's just keep going. And then when she finally said that, I turned around and I was like, yeah! And Michelle was like, can we please just watch the movie? Yeah, because like, to me at the start, it's like an A horror movie, like Hereditary or something like that. Yeah. But then it kind of gets a bit schlocky and B movie. I was down for that, but... It is like a turn from what the original setup is. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. But I think we get so much of that original setup. Like I think depression horror is its own genre now where you Mm -hmm. kind of like like interpret depression through the lens of horror. So to kind of have that swerve, I kind of appreciated that because it was like, you know, it isn't just this woman who's suffering from depression and it's thus monstrous. There is something monstrous kind of thing. And it is all like allegorical and, and like to it. But there's also moments where you see the mom be the mom within the depression like yeah. her mom at like her asking for food but when the mom goes missing from the car there is a bag of food with the cereal there kind of thing that's lovely yeah, that's yeah. Really nice. so there's those bits of her kind of coming to herself within it yeah yeah totally um i, I think people should absolutely check this movie out sure. i think like um that element of dublin hell like the particular kind of well maybe, maybe it's like an ireland thing as well but like that just particular grimness was so strong in it it I was very accurate in terms of its location i think out of the three of us i was probably the least down with where the film ended up going because i felt like halfway through it just after the joe dolan dancing scene i was so like i can't believe i have 45 minutes of this amazing fucking movie <laughs> left i can't wait to see where we go and like i was really really excited and then from kind of there i i felt like the last half of the film was a little bit like pieced together of by bits from other horror movies and like by the end of it like kind of you know the conclusion of the threat I was kind of like okay like it it didn't do a whole lot for me but I still thought the film as a whole was really strong and I think I just I was so into the depression stuff I wanted to see what they were going to do with it and I guess when they kind of swerved away from it I was like ah okay but like it's there's still so many good moments in the movie and it's so well made that yeah. and like it's an Irish fucking horror movie that I am at some point going to put on a list somewhere. I have some information about the director. Uh, Go for it. Kate Dolan. Uh, she graduated from the same college as us around the same time as us. And this is her first feature film. She's directed some short films and music videos for the Pillow Queens. Hell yeah. Which, and all we've we... done is this stupid fucking podcast. <laughs> but that all checks out. Another interesting thing and John it's a small world uh she was production designer on some of patrick's films and one of the films was the boxing movie that you're also in 
that was oh, made in like 2010. Weird. So I played a mean boxer. Did you? Yeah, I had yeah. to shave right. my head for it. Yeah, and so it was good. I got to, I got to I got to be like, ah, that guy is nothing. That she was because uh, I, I I like going on IMDb checking out what they've done. Uh, she was production designer on a couple of Patrick's films, and you can see it in her actual feature length work that because the production design in the in You Are Not My Mother is so good. Uh, but you might have met her on set. Maybe, yeah. I just thought that was very interesting. That is very interesting, Brian. That someone our age made this super cool film. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And deeply sad. Um, everyone who's not Irish should go listen to Joe Dolan's Good Looking Woman. I think oh, that's yeah. a song that just every Irish person knows. It's just okay. like... He's you, like the Irish you, Frank you, Sinatra. You guys have been saying... <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, fair He's enough, like yeah. a show band singer. <laughs> the fact that we will never capture the really specific look of delight and horror on Neve's face when you said that, Brian. <laughs> yeah. um, does Joe Dolan have a talk show? He's... No, I'm thinking of Joe Duffy. Yeah, that's yeah. a radio host. Joe Dolan's like dead like nearly 20 years. Brian, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know who he is. Oh, my God. Uh, John, you do. I don't. He was in Don't Believe I, I know, all the time. I know the song mm-hmm. Good Looking Woman. He had a puppet made of him and the puppet sang as well. Okay. And the puppet had... I know the Don't if... Believables. They're, they're good. Yeah. John Kenny and Pat Short. Pat Short is in a bunch of... He's in a film called Garage and that film's a really depressing movie yeah. as well. Yeah. I oh, love that movie. But yeah. yeah. Jeez, that film is a bummer. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, uh, uh, okay, so other Irish films that are worth checking out. Garage is an interesting one. The Window Shakes the Barley is also very good. What's that one and it's kind of like a, it's like, it's like someone trying to make a Quentin Tarantino movie. It's like a bunch of different things. I think Colin Farrell. No, Colin. Yeah, no. Who's a handsome Irish lad? Colin Farrell. Yeah, Colin, Colin Farrell. Farrell. He's in a, I don't know. I don't know. Really? Going over my head. Head. Is this one of those McDonough movies that the McDonough brothers make? There's Maybe. like two McDonough brothers and they used to be playwrights and now they make like films of varying quality. Some are Maybe. good. Some Maybe. Are... I don't know. Part of me wanted to answer Pierce Brosnan. He's <laughs> <laughs> pretty hot. I, he's, he's an attractive man. He looks good with a silver beard now. He does, uh, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, he looks like an evil wizard. Yeah. There's, that, there's that Jackie Chan film, The Foreigner, that <laughs> Pierce Brosnan's in and he's playing not Jerry Adams. That's a weird film. Yeah. It's 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 okay. It's it's the kind of movie you'd put on at Christmas and watch pissed. That sounds pretty alright. Yeah. Like That's I mean, my favorite genre of movie. Yeah, just not sober for it. Just not sober. I just love how like You're Not My Mother has just reframed that Joe Dolan song in my mind completely. Oh, oh I'm just never like, gonna be able to hear yeah, that. Yeah, because that's just like a song you grow up in the background of your life forever if you're in Ireland. I really like that it's a record on a record player yeah. because like that belongs to Granny. <laughs> and she's having such a good time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, class movie. You guys wanna talk about some video games? I know and we shall after wrestle talk. Here we fuck. I could see it on the dock, and you're gonna do some sort of talk over. Here you go. Go on. Okay. Okay. Can we get the wine flowing first? Oh yes, I'll do it. Thank you. Are we gonna pause, or are we just gonna let this roll? No, we can. No, let no, it no. Okay. You can talk about wrestling if you want, John. Okay, that's good because I have a lot of wrestling to talk about because. It's WrestleMania, nights one and two. Oh my god. Yeah. Eight hours of wrestling, baby. And I watched it all. So was there four hours one night, four hours a second night? Yes. Okay, because there's no way you could do eight hours in one go. They used to they used to have like a seven and a half hour event. I know what I'd do, Brian. I'd sit there with my arms crossed and I'd watch every fucking bit of it. And then at the end of it, I'd be like, holy oh, shit. No wonder the couch is fucked. <laughs> Oh, this uh, is going to be a big sock. Oh. Oh. Um, I have to keep eating it out. Yes. I, I keep buying cider and wine thinking I'm going to drink it. And now this is a... I don't know. I, You're just not drinking? No, but I'm gonna, I, yeah, it's been like two weeks since I've had a drink. And now I'm going to... The shit's going to hit hard. I got pretty drunk recently. I don't remember why, but it was pretty good. Thank you, Neve. Thank you very much, Neve. Okay. WWE... Probably the shittest it's been in a very long time. Um, it really feels like it's been run by a 77-year-old crazy person. Because it is. That's because it is. I did not have high hopes for WrestleMania. The 
storylines going in were not very compelling. There was very little like decent character work. There was very little long-term anything. It kind of felt like WWE just took their roster and was like, let's just put together the best event we can, but without any real build-up. And so I was... I was a little bummed out going into WrestleMania because like this will probably be shit. I just finished the Berserk video as well. It was all over the place and I didn't know what to expect. And WrestleMania, kind of fantastic on a level that really shocked me. Just across the board, I don't think there was one bummer match in the whole thing. And everyone was great. Becky Lynch, did you guys see Becky Lynch's fucking WrestleMania attire? She no. back? Yeah, she's back, and she's she's changed she's changed it up. Neve, could I ask you to look up Becky Lynch because my, my dyslexia won't allow me to talk and phone at the same time. Okay. Uh, Becky Lynch. Becky Lynch. WrestleMania. Okay. She looked like a beautiful alien queen, and she was facing Bianca Belair, and the two of them had a great match, really really good, and they kind of made up for Be- Becky Lynch like stepping on Bianca Belair at SummerSlam, and now they brought Bianca back, and she won legit. But Neve, what do you think? Oh, I think it looks good. She's got like the straight hair with the straight bangs. Yep. Um just and the under eye makeup. Yep. Yeah, it's it's kind of like kind of like you know that sick e-girl look yep. but like alieny. Yeah, and like very different from her like braids and half yeah. shade. Like, and like I I appreciate a wrestler who can switch it up. And yeah, because fo- usually her hair is massive. I'm looking at other photos. Yep. Yeah. She yep. usually has like a lion's mane. Yeah, this is a real like um Haley Williams look to yeah. it. Oh yeah, absolutely. From Paramore. Yeah, 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 yeah totally. She just looked, and like Bianca Belair also looked absolutely incredible. Like they just, they, and then they, they tore it down. It was a brilliant match. And like Bianca Belair now feels like a real legitimate superstar. Like she's had two WrestleMania just complete bangers and she's still young and like, God, there's so much she could go on and do. Um, fucking Foxcade, friend of the podcast, messages me, this is Becky Lynch's worst look. What? <laughs> I cannot imagine living a reality with that little fucking drip can you like i just that's what i said like i was just like i i respect you you're a good man but fuck off <laughs> man i didn't think he's such bad taste i know I, i'm shocked and like i've had conversations with this person for a, years how can a person be so wrong <laughs> i don't know it's just it's beyond me like i've a spoken false, to him a false and incorrect statement like brian we met him in person i feel bad yeah me too we won't. We shan't make that mistake again. But like the rest of it was just incredible. Like it was fucking brilliant. Stone Cold Steve Austin had his last match, and it was shit. But it didn't matter. Who was it against? Kevin Owens. Oh, okay. Kevin what? Owens is a wrestler who he he likes to fight, and he has to fight for his family because he doesn't have much money, and he's got to fight for his family. Now, don't mind that he signed to WWE and undoubtedly making six figures. Probably, That's not important. Okay, so this guy's a toy of him, and he, but he's still struggling. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, um, yeah, Stone Cold Steve Austin, like, and it was good. It was, it was, it was fine, right? What age is he now? I'm going to say early 50s. Um, but anyway, the next night, there was the match that absolutely stole the show, and I couldn't believe it. 57? 57? Wow. Holy shit. Wow. Because, like, didn't he still call, like, Stunner, like, Vince? We'll get to that. Oh, okay. Um, the so, Stu was born in 1964. That's a grand old age. So, the next night, Stone Cold um, is not there. Mm-hmm. But there is a match, and it was just the weirdest choice for a match. The wrestling have this new announcer called Pat McAfee. And he is a lovely little ray of sunshine. He is a genuine... He's a genuinely excitable dude. It's He has his own gimmick as a commentator, and that's that he's a fan of wrestling. Like, he's not like, well, it sure looks like Jeff Hardy is going to hit the other guy with the leg drop, and he will be in trouble when that happens. He'll be like, oh, it's a Jeff Hardy leg drop. I can't believe I'm seeing this. Like, he's just... Mm. He's so amped all the time, and honestly, he's he's kind of fucking adorable for that reason. A mean wrestler challenged him to a wrestling match. But you can't do that. You can't do that. And, you know, I'm not a big fan of non-wrestlers wrestling at WrestleMania. It's kind of a common thing. I think pay your wrestlers, you know, like... Yeah, but in eight hours, you have to have a clown show. You do. You can have a clown show with wrestlers, including one particular wrestler called Doink the Clown. (laughs) But anyway, like... Pat McAfee comes out, turns out the dude's a trained wrestler, 
and they completely tear the house down in a way that I am guessing has scared the shit out of WWF because they have another Daniel Bryan on their hands. They have this person that the fans love so, so much and they will now want to be champion. I want to see Pat McAfee fight Roman Reigns. That's what I want to happen. That's nuts. Was this like a thing that, like a setup all along that he would I don't be a, th- like fight? No, I think, I think don't think they had any idea. Well, I, he used it to It just be went an, down better than they and than Much expected. better. You see, he has a history as a wrestler. He used to want to be a wrestler and he used to be in NXT. And I just don't think anyone thought he could go like he could. Yeah. But and like, it was more than like being a good wrestler. He just had that fucking X charisma. You know, he like there's this thing in wrestling I always feel like where you can tell if someone has it the moment they walk through the curtain. And if someone doesn't have it, it's very hard for them to get it. They have to go through major life events. Roman Reigns did not have it. He just fucking didn't for years and years and years. Dude got leukemia. He went away. He survived a really life altering thing. He came back and he had it. I don't know how to explain it, but that's what it is. And that's. Pat McAfee had it. He came through the curtain and there was just something electric there straight away. And it was beautiful to see. And he beats Austin Theory and the crowd went fucking insane. And then 77-year-old Vince McMahon comes down to the <laughs> ring. Boo. And he's like, you want to fight? I'll fight you. And Pat McAfee's like, okay, come on, Vince. And Vince starts taking off his fucking jacket. <laughs> what age is Vince? And then he puts his jacket back on. Of course he does, because he... He's got nothing to fucking say. He's like a yeah. barking dog. Yeah. Then he starts taking his jacket off again. Oh. Then his shirt. Mm. Then he gets in the ring. And then the fucking bell rings. And 77-year-old Vince McMahon beats the shit out of Pat McAfee. Really? Yep. And it's terrible. Yeah, I can. It's really bad. I, I can barely stand. Connect. Yeah. Oh, oh, like, Vince... He doesn't take bumps. He stands in the middle of the ring, like, clotheslining Pat McAfee. Um, it was genuinely horrible. And, and then you're like, okay, that kind of ruined that moment. And then Stone Cold Steve Austin's music hits. And I stood up in my sitting room and I, like, I don't know, peacock walked with like my hands out in front of me kind of like this like I was feeding myself going (laughs) and it was just beautiful Stone Cold Steve Austin and Vince McMahon in the ring again and and Vince McMahon took what is by far the worst Stone Cold stunner I have ever seen in my have you guys seen this thing i have seen a clip of this Mm. isn't it just incredible it's like it's awful but honestly that's how if you talk like a 77 year old man taking a stone cold stunner that's what that looks like here's the funny thing neve vince mcmahon this was the worst stunner he's ever taken not by that much oh despite how many times vince mcmahon has been hit by the stunner he has never taken it well ever in his entire life. The first time he got hit by a stunner, he, he fell onto the ground and then he started acting like he was getting electrocuted. <laughs> really solid. <sad. laughs> yeah. Um, and it was just, there was so many moments like that. Triple H retired. Um, oh. Johnny Knoxville's match with Sami Zayn was fucking brilliant. I keep meaning to record it for you guys because I think you'd really like it. Because well, like, it's Tom and Jerry, isn't it? It's Tom and Jerry. Someone gets slapped with a giant hand. Uh, a wrestler gets trapped in a gigantic mouse trap. Brilliant. Wee Man is there. Oh yeah. Um, Dark Shark is there. It's <laughs> Dark Shark's there. Dark Shark's there. Dark Shark's there. Dark Shark's yeah. really cool. They all are. Party Boy is there, and you can tell a lot of people in the WrestleMania audience did not know who Party Boy was, but they made it work. You know, they made it work. And um, Ronda Rousey had a match with Charlotte, and it just it just didn't really connect. And Ronda Rousey got really pissed. And I don't think she's going to be in wrestling for long because when everything's don't go her way, she's really not subtle about it. She also has the weird charisma of like a a strange broom. <laughs> um, I think I'm good with, without her. You know, yeah. you just don't need her. She she is a good wrestler, but yeah, Jake no Logan Paul had a fucking match. I bet he was brilliant. He seems oh, yeah. like an MJF kind Actually, of guy. I, I I did see that he came out with a Pokemon card around his neck, didn't yeah. he? He does that. He did that the last time when he, he had his boxing match. fight and yeah. he had the Charizard. This time he had the Illustrator Pikachu. Yeah. Fuck. 
I've seen a lot of people say like he was okay, like he was mm-hmm. fine. Those people are wrong. He was fucking brilliant. Really? And I can see it. That he guy's was, a he dick. He was okay. He was <laughs> he's a good heel. In a good way. He, he was like he was quite a good wrestler for someone who has not wrestled a lot. There was a lot working for him. There was some stuff in his like selling and in like the anim okay. If wrestling is animation, he doesn't have like the secondary action down. He okay. doesn't have the weight down. But he has like he, he's getting there. Like if he wanted to be a wrestler, he could be. But there's this one fucking bit where he's standing in the ring. This entire arena of 70,000 people is booing him. And he looks right down the camera lens. And he does the most shit-eating grin I have ever seen. When I talk about like like wrestlers having that X factor, he had it in that moment. He could be a legendary heel if he so choose. I'm not a big fan of Logan Paul. I like him better than the other fucking thing. But like, you know, I don't like him much. He was, this was the best celebrity performance a celebrity has put on in wrestling. He obviously gave a shit. He obviously trained. He obviously cared. I don't think he's a good person. I think he could be an amazing heel. So, yeah. I came out of WrestleMania with my fucking ass blown off. Um, It was a great show. Uh, Roman Reigns beat Brock Lesnar. Um, Don't need any more Brock Lesnar. I'm, I'm done. That's it. That's cool. Fine. But in doing so, Roman Reigns has unified the titles, meaning he is now the one true champion. And to me, Roman Reigns, like, I'm not, this was not his best performance or anything. He, he suffered a major injury halfway through the match. But to me, Roman Reigns is now at the point where he is a Triple H. He is a rock. He is a stone cold. He is someone you build the entire industry around. And I am delighted for the guy. I think he's immensely talented. And I think he's had an incredible journey. And he's just a generation defining heel. And, um, yeah wrestling wwe they fucking got me back and proved me wrong in many ways i still think the week-to-week television is garbage i want to see it improve i am now rooting for that company yeah that's wrestle talk do you guys know a lot of people skip wrestle talk really yep makes me sad and then they comment about skipping it and it's like, guys. I don't even think you should skip Wrestle Talk. Yeah, and if anyone's going to skip Wrestle Talk. Although, Neve, Neve, you're coming over the dark side. I kind of am. Yeah. You are. Yeah. yeah. When I saw this happen, I was just like, oh, damn. <laughs> I should have watched this. I listen, but I take a little nap. It's fine. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Strategy Talk. talk about Elden Ring first or last? Do you want to just get out of the way? I think get it out of the way. Okay. Shit game. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys remember how many hours and what level you are? Yes. I am 120 hours in and I'm level 110. So I'm not as keeping my hour to level, but I also need a lot of runes to level up now. Mm. I'm 102 hours in and I'm a level... 186. Wow! <laughs> How do you do this? I found that bird. Oh, so you're just farming runes like a madman. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I think I'm 60 hours in level, I think, 77. Wow. Not farming runes, just good video games. I've done... Ev- I keep running back to the t- to the camp like a little coward is what I keep doing. <laughs> yeah, anytime I get to a certain number of runes, I'm like... Okay. Oh, I scamper. Yeah. Back to easy zone. Yeah, so back I can to the just, easy zone. Yeah, I don't lose my monies. I've done everything in this game except fight the last boss, more or less. Really? Yeah. Um, Brian, yeah. which is the hardest boss? There's an optional final area in the game that's at the very north of the map. People who are who've been there know what I'm talking about. It's a very difficult area to navigate. It's full of booby traps and kind of learn your lesson enemy placements. Right. Okay. Where you just die every ten steps and then every time you like renew it, you're like, I, I get ten steps further and then you die again. Sure, sure. Um the boss of that is a Valkyrie character who's been in the trailer since the beginning, so it was nice to see that character. It's not Melina, is it? It is. Okay. Millennia, Melenia. Is she not the end boss? No. Oh. She's an optional boss. Oh! Um, I did not know this. <laughs> she's okay. She has... I, I don't want to get the spoilers with her, but I wasn't... You need a certain build to 
fight her satisfyingly or like fight her in a way that feels like you're accomplishing something because the way I'm fighting her at the moment it's just frustrating and I don't know what I'm doing wrong and I don't know what I'm doing right so I had a person come on one of my uh, Patreon streams um, who had beaten this game three times and this was like like three weeks ago yeah there's some people who just run through it and they're like their playtime is 40 hours each and stuff and they were and they were like um this game's great. Some of the bosses are fucking bullshit. Yeah. And I didn't understand that at the time. I do now a bit. The bosses in the latter half of the game, you're going to see a lot of reuse and then the yeah. kind of unique bosses look cool, but the like mechanics and strategies you need to put into the fights aren't satisfying. I think it's kind of frustrating how much you have to invest in vigor because like you mm-hmm. get one shotted so hard by everything. So if yeah. you have yeah. like like glass cannon builds where you're kind of trying to use magic, that does not become viable and now you have to just spill a whole pile of levels into so getting I, your I'm health I'm the exact bar. same. I'm right now I'm running with a glass cannon build and it's it's fun. I like it, mm-hmm. but like I need immense vigor because I'm not a glass if otherwise the glass is already broken yeah. by the yeah. time I get to the fight. Yeah, it's definitely a build later on in the game where you need to have a lot of health, but also be able to attack from a long distance. Not even a medium distance is going to cut it for some of those ones. Especially the final, final boss isn't interested in fighting you. And it's in this big arena where you can't close the gap. There's so many ones with huge uh, arenas. I've been doing Rani's quest line and you have to fight a horrible bug like a bloodborne see, ask see i really bug. like that boss battle <laughs> yeah uh and that felt special but later on it isn't Man. yeah and like there's a lot the of Rennie space to cover but once yeah. i figured that out like i, I really liked that boss by yeah. the end of it people do not like scarlet rot i just gotta say i love love poisoning everything scarlet rot fucking sucks mm-hmm. yeah because like because like there are status effects like poison and freezing and like there's one place where it actually does frenzy and i was like oh it's like bloodborne did you guys but uh, scarlet rot is a fucker did you guys meet those dogs that do like ten thousand blood loss damage yes <laughs> <laughs> i just I, I had no idea that that was like a bug and i was just running through the world and a dog just oh, yeah, jumps like, up yeah, it's just like I mean, it's a regular like dog ten thousand damage and i was like oh I guess I'm under leveled for this area. Okay. This game is still getting patched weekly. Like like that Redan boss got patched up and then patched mm. down. I think so, I, I I think later game bits will need to be patched as well. So R- Rodan's a weird one to me because like I heard all the shit about how hard Rodan is and all this kind of stuff. But I'm ge- I guess what's happening is people aren't using the arena summons. Yeah. And the fact that yeah. you can resummon the summons. Yeah. Because to me, like I I think I fought him. The day he got repatched, and I don't know if it was before or after, but that's the day I beat him. I just like to me, like the entire point of that fight is like the idea that all your allies and yeah. everyone is like coming together to fight this. Yeah, fight. It's and, like cool. it's that's good that's I, like I like that interpretation of that fight. I don't I don't feel any need to like it's, it's the festival. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't feel any need to, but like more power to people who do. I think, I think, I think we're kind of at the point now where we need to get good at just being like. Hey, whatever way you want to fucking play this shit, it doesn't matter. I really hate when some things are called a cheese. Like, I remember watching a video and it was like a Redan cheese. This was after I beat him. But the cheese was the way I beat him, which was just breeding Scarlet Rot on, rot on him. And I was like, that's not a cheese. I had to kill a fucking dragon to get know. a heart and buy my Scarlet like, Rot in yeah, Kang like, like, that. like That's the yeah. narrative of your character. And yeah. I think that's fun. You exactly. know, like, I, I think that's cool. I just, you earned that. But like, there's just like some gamers are so weird about what is an honorable way to fight. I want something. my melee build without and it's a shield. Like, like I'm like I'm playing like a character who uses incantations. I'm gonna use the big dragon incantation. Yeah, and it's like it's there in the game for a reason. It's like if you're playing if you're playing the game in a way that's counterintuitive to what you enjoy, that's fucking silly. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. um, like I don't really use summons that much just because I had one boss fight against the the rebirth woman. Renala? Ren- yeah. Yeah, and my little goblin squad just surrounded her and yeah. beat the shit out of her in a way that, like, I didn't find fun. So I don't really use that kind of stuff anymore. I don't, but, like, to me, it's a role playing game. If you're, if the role your character is playing is, like, a weird rogue wizard who cheats and does everything they can, that's fucking fun. That's cool. Like, we should encourage that kind of stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, it shouldn't be this. I, Dark Souls is not this stupid fucking gamer test. And, like, it's become so warped as well that, like, 
mechanics that the game designers put in the fucking game they're like considered cheap or like not playing the game move, properly yeah. and it's it's like it, it's like like I don't use a lot of that shit because I love the idea of like duels and one on ones like it's a fighting game but that's how you're role playing it yeah exactly um, but like I, I think it's really interesting to hear stories when, like I didn't know you could be Rodan with Scarlet Rot that's fucking cool yeah that guy is super yeah. rotted already yeah he's Read really weak a little to more it. on yeah. him he's like oh no but you can also if you stand by the water he, when he is a meteor you can drown him by having his meteor land in the sea that's which super fun as well I saw a that's video on that and I was great. like that's cool that's, that's such a fun nice. way of killing him like that's really fun yeah um, I actually had like a kind of breakthrough with that game today i've been i've been rocking sword and board the entire way through and uh, a lot of very careful play just mm. like okay the enemy's gonna use i'm gonna block this attack because i'm really bad at dodging it then i'm gonna dodge the second hit then i'm gonna block the third attack and then dodge the fourth encounter like a lot of that kind of shit i was kind of coming to the end of a session one night and i was like i wonder what it's like to go dual handed and so i equipped two big heavy swords i had but they weren't as heavy as they thought they'd be. And I'd be like, hang on, if I rejig my armor, I can actually like I can actually dual wield these, and that's kind of interesting. And I had no like I had no aspirations to make this a practical build. I was just fucking around. And so I ran around and killed a few enemies dual wielding. And like, because I'm dual wielding two massive swords, all of a sudden these like roadblock enemies that were like stopping me in my tracks, I was literally like crashing through them it's like one or two hits would like break their guard and then i could just kill them and like once i got a combo going they couldn't stop me and like the combos with these two particular swords are really wide sweeping and long range as well and it's totally changed the way i fight in that game in like a really fun way because now it's like no fight lasts long because like I'm I'm wearing fuck all armor like a cu- like a couple of hits will kill me but if I get going into my combo I will just kill everything and it's really it's totally changed Dark Souls like the Dark Souls style like really careful combat into this thing where like my battles feel like car crashes now it's like either I'm gonna just I'm gonna fly in there and it's gonna go good for me or it's not but like the amount of damage I am doing and taking is like it's really exhilarating and I just didn't no, the game could be played like this, and I'm having it's kind. Of, it's kind of like reawakened my love for this game. Not that it was really going anywhere, but yeah, I'm also I'm also like making my way through the, the is it the this Lindell the city, the underground city. Mm, it's the place up the north of the map where the Erd Tree is. Yeah, that's like yeah, uh, Lindell. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There. So did you do Volcano Manor? I did nearly all of Volcano Manor. Because the girl with the bad posture invites you there. Yeah. She's so cute. Yeah. She's lovely. Yeah. <laughs> nice person. I, she, she didn't, I found her there, but she didn't invite me there. I oh. found her in a gazebo and I yeah. gave her her stolen necklace back. And Same. she was like, and then I met her at Altus Plateau at the beginning. And she was like, do you want to go there? And I went to Volcano Manor before I even did Altus. Wow. I kind of feel like Volcano Manor is a cool place, but it also feels like unfinished because like I'm now rocking Tanit's armor, the lady from there, because I yes. did all the quests. I killed the boss. She's just kind of munching on the dude's brain. I go when I meet Patches and he gives me castanets and then just fucks off and dies maybe. And then I give them to her. She does not give a shit. Do you know Patches can join you in the Rodan fight? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I had Patches there. <laughs> like little he Patches. Just yeah. He doesn't do anything. <laughs> yeah. Piece of shit. Uh, but, um... but I loved Patches. So I thought it was like really like weird that his like his story just kind of it seemed to be cannot tied to volcano manor and then it just yeah it just stops it just stops being in it and she kind of doesn't do anything else so i just was like fuck it i'm killing you and taking your armor and that's what i'm rocking or something yeah Yeah. like like for me a bunch of characters just stop being in the game but um i got to the end of volcano manor and i i went in and i met the snake devouring god yes and i just yeah the visual of that boss is so horrifying that i fought it once and i was like you know what not in a great headspace for this, and I haven't fought him since. He's not too bad if you use the the the, the give you a gimmick, the, the spear. Weapon, yeah. yeah, but um, then I went and I I went down into Rodan's meteor mm, place. Yeah, and that teleported me really deep into what's it called, Brian Lindale? No, Nocturne, Nocturnal, the 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 Eternal City, something. Yeah, like that. that, and that's where I am now. And you're going God, along the Shea for a river. That is a beautiful location. Yeah, mm. um, I love the weird little trumpet men. They are cute. They're very fun. Yeah, uh, still very high on that game, and I think my my switch over to my 
dual wielding car crash build has just kind of just changed everything for me and it's, it's I, I love it I'm dual wielding like two seals so I'm just drawing magic from each hand each time Whoa, that's so it's very sick fun. it's cool how you can get loads of magic like at the end you could have like 10 different spells I didn't even know you could do that it's fun yeah, yeah. I, I, I got I want to do two fists at some point <laughs> I think I'm going to look really stupid <laughs> I like how much, like, how, like, we're just all playing it so differently. Like, yeah, I think that's how really are you fun playing it, Brian? Um, I got, so, for me, my favorite parts are definitely the dungeons and just exploring them. I love some of the catacombs and how they actually have puzzles you need to solve. And that mm-hmm. you need to, like, hit certain switches or find a switch deep inside and then you unlock the, the front door or the, the side door that you need to get through. Um, but I, I, I love the dungeons. I love navigating them. Um, the boss battles the good dungeons yeah. are amazing yeah later on there's less dungeons and there's only like one other like hyper jail thing because there's lots of them at the beginning yeah and they just sort of drip away yeah uh, even with the catacombs and the caves there's less of those the yeah, more there's definitely areas less you of go them. on i have seen a couple of people say that like the end of the game is definitely less finished than the start yeah i i, I honestly think this game should have been delayed another three months Maybe another year. <laughs> yeah. I want Patch's story told. Patch yeah. my patch. Like, I, I don't think I've hit that point yet, but that is a bummer. Yeah. Um, I did take the disc out of my system. Yeah. I had to. Yeah. <laughs> and it's I really felt, addictive. I took, like, I felt like I was taking out a solid gold disc and I was putting Star Wars, the like a Star Wars the Skywalker <laughs> saga in there and yeah. I felt like feeding my PlayStation 5 like a piece of salami after <laughs> taking out, yeah. like, gold. I put in Ghostwire Tokyo and I was like, what am I doing? Oh, wow. Well, um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think for me, I'm going to pause my playthrough because I don't want to go into New Game Plus. I, I guarantee this time next year there will be an ultimate edition of this game with a dlc pack I, I, i'm like i haven't beat this game i'm so fucking excited for the dlc because from do such cool stuff with the yeah. dlc like they gotta do some form of this where you know because like I, they, they, they've always done a lot of the games oh they, some, they will some revised version like, of this game that's the fully dlc batched. of this game is going to sell more than many other games that will be released this year yeah like I, i'm still the thing that's really blowing me away still is just like the fan community around elden ring like there's so much shit and it's like it's like all over tiktok and the videos are getting hundreds of thousands of likes you know and it's just like quick lore videos that are like a minute long lore videos like here's a weird weapon that you've never heard of like Mm. there's one weapon that's just a giant finger Mm. it's really hard to find yeah um i was in the place that had it and i beat that place and i didn't know that was there yeah I didn't know either. I had to follow like a like a, I was like you would never find that unless like you wouldn't go down that path. It's lava there. Yeah. It's weird how lava in the in the game just doesn't kill, kill you. you. Yeah. yeah. It, it just, just makes you slow. It just makes you slow and chips away your health a tiny bit, but nothing compared to like scarlet rot or yeah. anything like that. It's just lava. But like lava is awful stuff. <laughs> yeah, very dangerous. <laughs> yeah. Like if you be careful, in, listener. <laughs> if you stood in lava, you'd be like you just burn up and oh, turn that would be bad saying that you're tarnished is super quiet like all the time but when she like dies by fire oh, oh my god, oh my that god. Howling scream. <laughs> yeah, that is it. she really she, she hates it not a fan um i've been like uh i fought like i think the god skin duos like fucking four or five times now oh and I, my god i just hate them not because they're hard i really like I just, the one that turns into a wheel yeah like i just don't like them i just don't like fighting them yeah I don't I, think I, I, you're not the only person i've heard say that mm. i think that's a bummer because the original god skin dude you fight um oh fuck where do you, you fight him in the in the in the windmill town don't you at the top i think i fought him somewhere else i fought him in like uh, Radan's tower. Oh, at the basement. Yeah, he, that fight's really hard. Mm. Like he's the wrong level or the wrong amount of HP for that area. It doesn't make any sense. That I, th- he's I that think difficult. whatever way it worked, I was probably at a. I was at the right level. I like it was a very hard fight. I really enjoyed it. I think I'm really bad at these games. I don't think you are. I think I am because yeah, you I, 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 I. No, I've beaten loads of them. I don't think I'm. But like when I hear people being like, like you were there and you, like being like. I had to try that boss like like five, six, seven times. I'd say most of these bosses I'm fighting at least 10 or 12 times. Yeah, okay, maybe you're about Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. I think it's so weird to me, but like, because I feel like so many different people get stuck on different bosses. Like, I yeah. saw someone in our comments say they hated the Felstar Beast. 
I love that fight. I thought that was great. That's Who's the, the one star beast. It's thing? the one that's a bull, but its face is like a beetle mouth. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's got I, the I, antler I, mouth. I and it's like the thing once, bull. and I was like, I'm, I'm out of here. I love that fight. I fought him like maybe three times. Yeah, but yeah like, three times. But wait, you're my, a spell user, aren't you? Yes. Okay. So that really worked Weapons for me. Weapons bounce off him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's he's made of rock. Doesn't like lightning. I just got a lightning spell and it kicks ass. Oh, mm-hmm. I'm so excited. I'm trying to play that game every second day because otherwise I'm not going to have anything else to talk about on this podcast. I know. And I'm very cognizant of that as well, but I'm so addicted to it. I'm so addicted to it and I am a little resentful that I spend so much time with it, but I do kind of love it. Yeah. Like sometimes, yeah, I, come a great out, game. sometimes I come out across a vista or I see a new boss fight and I just, it fills me with happiness. Like real... Mm-hmm. I am eating good art, you know? And, like, I love Rodan's boss fight so much. I love everything about that boss fight. Like, I, I really... I loved the the, the snake-eating god. Pooed a little. Was so frightened. Um, just, that game is making me... And then, like, you know, I, I love the, the Eternal City. I think it's so beautiful. When you see that giant fucking calcified dragon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. God damn. Um, it's a beautiful video game. I, I love it. Not like, of course, it's not perfect. Like the idea that it's perfect would be silly. No, but there's no. great those bosses are a bit fucked. Up. Some yeah. of those, some of those bosses could have used more time in the oven for mm-hmm. sure. But I teabag every boss after I beat it. Nice. Even Rodan, uh, even Rodan, especially Rodan. <laughs> especially yeah, Rodan. someone's got a teabag. Well, just face. while it's bursting into spectral ash, I'm just there clicking away, <laughs> and my girlfriend is just like, "That isn't attractive when you." <laughs> 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 She got to be a gamer. <laughs> got to be a gamer. Any, uh, we, we shall move on unless there are any final thoughts on Elden Ring. I'm probably not going to play it anymore. Uh, uh, for now. I want to believe you, Brian. Yeah, me too. Like, I, I want that for you. I'm going to play it so much. I love playing it. I'm going to retry and only play it every second for fun. <laughs> I feel like Mich- my first playthrough is going to be like 250 hours. That's, I want. That's a good number. Yeah. Michelle's away this weekend. Let me fucking tell you what's going to happen. See, that's what happened to me the first weekend, or no, the second weekend, because I, I bought it and didn't play it for a week, and then I was in a weird headspace, and I stayed up till 3 a.m., and then 4 a.m., and then I fucked up my sleep schedule when I was home alone for a weekend. And then that's when it, yeah. Wouldn't it be really funny if it wasn't our game of the year? <laughs> well, maybe it won't be. Brian, let's talk about Ghostwire Tokyo. Okay. I've played uh, I played two or three hours of Ghostwire Tokyo, and I'm enjoying it. Um, oh, good. We were talking about Irish folklore earlier on. Uh, this is Japanese folklore, which uh, is yokai, the various different spirits. This is a first person action adventure game that has shooting but not guns, I guess, blasting psychic beams from your hands. The setup is really like a scene in manga, sort of like Gantz or something similar, where you're just in Shibuya Crossing and everyone has fallen asleep and a lot of people have just been like popped and it's just clothes left behind. They got rapture bombs. Yeah, they got rapture bomb for sure. And you're just playing a guy who gets possessed by a demon uh, or some sort of like disembodied voice. He's not quite sure, but he has to go to his sister in the hospital. I've done the first two chapters of this game. I just want to talk about one negative thing and this game brings it up. I just want to talk about it as an example off the top of my head don't like when games do this in chapter one of this game you have to get to the hospital get to that and so you make your way to the hospital you go up all the you go four flights of stairs getting through all the different barricaded bits of this ruined hospital talk to your sister you get a cutscene. then by exiting the hospital you have to exit all the way back down the way you came from that is a lack of qa yeah and i don't like when games do that and when you do that in chapter one maybe don't do that that kind of bummed me out. Chapter two is much better, and I'm enjoying that a lot more. Yeah. Okay, good. Because yeah, I've heard I've heard kind of mixed things about this game. I've heard it's got some real strong points. I've also heard it gets a little repetitive. Oh yeah, for sure. Okay, I'm only like two hours in, and I can already feel like like to 100 percent this game is not fun. Yeah. Okay. But also, uh, I I kept doing a bunch of side quests instead of going along the critical path, and the side quests were fun. But it is just like it's a double A studio game for sure. You, see, you say that and part of me gets excited. Yeah, like like there's stuff in it where you're like, oh, cool, they're, they're, they're being weird. But then they're also just kind of like being really reusy about some stuff. Like, Brian, let me, th- let me throw a concept out there. 
Dreamcast energy? Uh, Because we're going to talk about another game I think kind of has Dreamcast energy. Ghostwire Tokyo definitely feels like... Yeah, like a very good game on the PlayStation 2 (laughs) that maybe like five people played and are like, it's really fucking good. See, I kind of look at this game and I feel like in four years, this is going to be a game that people are like, oh, you know, people missed out on that. It's yeah. a real good little game. Yeah, because at the moment it's a PS5 exclusive, I mm. think, on console. I don't know if it's on Windows yet. Like, it, it's own, it's distributed by Bethesda. So it'll end up on every, it'll end up on Windows and Xbox eventually at like 30 quid. Because at the moment it's like 60 quid. So, like, this game will get its audience because, like, it, so far it's a decent game. But I'm going to play more of it now. Cool. But my first impressions of it are mixed, but hopeful. Neve, you played a little Tunic. Yeah, I decided to play Tunic to see what all the fuss was about. And I was really enjoying the exploration of it. I, like, because I've, I've spoke to you, I kind of knew to check kind of little nooks and crannies and kind of... A lot of them little nooks. Little nooks. And I was really enjoying that, finding like a little a little passageway that was in a shadow or mm. there was a tree in the way, but you could actually make your way around it and find a chest and stuff. So I'm finding chests and I'm finding a whole pile of like currency in the chests. I don't know what the currency is for. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That, I don't know what it's for. That's that game. And then I die and then I lose the currency. Oh no. And I'm like, I don't know how important that was. Um, so I'm enjoying the exploration of it and for ages I didn't have a weapon so I was just dodge rolling all the enemies and that felt really good as well because I figured I can get the enemies to cut down the plants that were blocking my way and Did you have a stick? I, I went back and got the stick but I didn't have the stick for a long time Oh my god So I was just rolling That's fascinating And getting the guys with the swords to cut down the bushes so I could get things That's clever so, you don't get this actual sword to do that for a while either. Yeah. Then I got the sword. And I'm really liking how everything leads into each other. I'm not as enamored with the book as everyone else seems to be. Every time I read the book, it's just like, yeah, I figured that out. Like, because I've been told it's kind of like mysterious, I've been pressing all the buttons, I guess. You know, you know when you play a game and you're like, I'm not going to read the tutorial. I'm yeah. not going to read this because I'll figure it out through feel. How many mm-hmm. pages have you found? Um, like six. Okay. Did you find out about the upgrade screen? No. Okay, that was the one for me that I was like, mm-hmm. excuse me? Upgrade screen? No, I did. The page that I found helpful was the one like, because I knew these things were bombs, but I wasn't sure if they were all bombs of different like yeah. what they did but it just confirmed yes they are all explosives from and that what, you should throw them what I've heard about that game like the manual is necessary like yeah. beating the game without the manual is nearly impossible but yeah like I, the first couple I picked up as well I was kind of like okay cool yeah I was just and like I, these are pretty but yeah. but then eventually I did get one or two where I was like uh, what uh, is, w- like what can I do? This is very crucial information. Like, like this is very crucial information, and I've been able to do this the whole time. Mm. Okay. Actually, I actually put down tunic because I couldn't have tunic and Elden Ring happening at the same time. Yeah, well, that's kind of this is the point that I'm getting to. Really love the exploration. Really like the environments. They're really, really pretty. Mm. I hate the combat in that it's game. Not great. It's it not is great. Not good at all. I don't yeah. like it at all. I beat the first kind of like the major boss kind of guy that you need to go behind and you get your shield and well you get your shield the other way but the first kind of roadblock boss mm-hmm. little guy and it killed me more times than an Elden Ring boss wow. and I felt my like my reach wasn't long enough I felt like yeah I, I, his I, reach I was always feel far. like I could do with just a little bit more reach yeah like he feels very stumpy and but there's I a lot of it like there is a yes. lot of combat I would call this more a combat focused game than uh, it's not like the puzzle game is all like environmental like you figure out the how to traverse the environment you get down a step okay well this is a latch that drops down the stairs and that's fine They're, they aren't really puzzles it's mm. like you just engage with the environment and you can kind of figure it out like there's no real puzzly puzzles oh there is absolutely Okay. Puzzles. I'm hope I'm that's what I'm looking for because I would love for this game to be more puzzle focused than mm. it is combat focused because I am not enjoying the combat. I did yeah, see like I think I'm with you there. 
there's just something about it. I don't know. I, I just there's it's a feel thing, right? Yeah. It's like there's just there's probably very slight knobs and dials that could be tweaked that could make this feel like just very minor things could make it feel a lot better. I feel like if I just had a little bit more reach, even. Yeah. So like I figured out then later on that I can use my gold currency to buy bombs. Nice. So how I've been like really dealing with enemies is I just throw bombs at them. That's I just, what I'm doing. Just and it's way more satisfying. Yeah, and they yeah. just blow the fuck up. And then I'm like, I feel like I'm kind of cheating these guys, but whatever, it's working. Um, I know there is accessibility options where you can like turn invincibility on, but I kind of hate that there's just either it's hard as nails in to a point that it doesn't feel good. And it's not even that it's hard. It's just it's like there's something about the feel of it I don't like that makes me not want to try bother with it. You sure. know. And then it's just off. I wish there was something in the middle where maybe mm. the enemies had like half the HP or you had like double damage or something. I wish there was a mid midway between yeah, complete I, I invincibility. Think, I think more accessibility options like that and more bad things. Is. In terms of its exploratory stuff, I think it's really fun and really sweet and I'm really enjoying it. Good vibe. Yeah, yeah. I put it on and I kind of thought I did I wouldn't like it because I don't like I don't really like Zelda games. And I was like, I'll just pay this for half an hour. And then it was like three hours later. And I was just like... Yeah, it does suck you yeah. in. I was just like, oh, I know how to get to that chest now. I know how to get here. Ooh, let's go in here. And there's like a place where you go into a little house and there was nothing there. And I was like, fuck. And then I was like, oh, a secret door yeah. to a secret bigger door. I worry that, that so much of that game is about learning to navigate that landscape that at some point my brain isn't going to be able for it. Because I'm just... I like. I don't go. I don't plan to go anywhere in that game. My, I, I, I stumble into the right place eventually, and I yeah. think that might kind of, that might bother me a lot after a while. Can you remember locations and the the branching paths? Norm, normal humans can. I'm I sure. don't think so because I can't. I but was just, playing just, with just Rebecca. Just the fact that the game has like two perspectives, so that means there's a two versions of every location. The the, the perspective is like a fifteen degree tilt yeah. upwards. Yeah. Like it's so tiny. I think someone like Brian will really probably get his teeth into this. But I was oh, asked, I acting my girl asking my girlfriend like I was just like is that the room where the boss is and she was like yes and you drop the ladder so you can go in this way now. So she was like remembering the stuff for me because I was like I nearly wanted to get to the boss by going all the way around again and get to it and she was just like no you've created this shortcut. Things weren't visually distinct enough that I was remembering specific rooms. Yeah, shit like that doesn't always click with me either. Like, we've had this conversation before, but you know, like, you know that bit that everyone loves in Dark Souls games when they open up shortcuts? My reaction to that is always like, oh, fuck, I'm back where I started. <laughs> oh, I love it. I know, and like, I get that's my, that's my broken brain. See, for me, um, like, in the 3D Zelda games, they, like since o Ocarina of Time, they've done a thing where that if you unlock a door, or you unlock a ladder, or some or spawn in a chest, camera, so it cuts to that shot and establishes it, then it zooms out and points Link at where he, he, he is to go to that. Mm. And I guess with a fixed camera game like that, sometimes when you make the shortcut, it might be, you know, over in the corner of the screen. Yeah. But if there's just some nod where, you know, it kind of highlights a bit more to you. There is like telescopes you can find that will give you that zoomed out bit and you can kind of see where everything interconnects then. And you can be okay, like, okay, I handy. haven't been to here kind of thing. So that's helpful. It also gives you like a page I found is a map, but I found it's a lovely illustration, but it's a terrible map. <laughs> like yeah. I was just like, I don't even know where I am on this. And I was like, okay, here I am. And does it have an indicator on it? It has the little drawing of the fox. But I think it it's always so takes small. me ages yeah, to, to find, find it. That yeah. yeah, so I I don't really use that that much. I'm, I'm going by feel. There's a lot. There's a lot of shit I really love about that game. I worry it's going to frustrate me to the point that I'm never going to finish it. And I want to finish it because I admire so much of like I think the things it does. It does really incredible and in a way that I, I haven't seen a lot before. You know. So yeah, yeah. Tunic. The I'll keep game. going with it. My favorite game. <laughs> Ryan's game of the year. Oh, I love it. Or is it Kirby and the Forgotten Land? Oh, I really like Kirby and the Forgotten Land too. It's a good game. It's a very good Kirby game. Kirby is out and about, gets sucked into an altered dimension called the Forgotten Land. And from there, he's entered a Z depth. He's in the third dimension. We talked about Dreamcast energy earlier. This is a fucking Dreamcast game. Yeah, this... 
this is just like this is way off the beaten track of a traditional Kirby game. Obviously, it's a Kirby game tonally, but just in its subtle stuff, it is just, it's very different. And I'm liking that. First thing off the top of my head, there's a way smaller roster of moves and abilities, but within that, you can upgrade them. I was very upset to see, like, Fighter and Yo-Yo. I'm and, so bummed not to see Fighter and Grappler. Yeah. Beam, which is like always been in the game, is missing from this game, and I find that really surreal. But then, like stuff like bomb is in it, and the way you upgrade the bomb ability is super fun. The fire ability upgrades you into a dragon. Oh, cool! I've upgraded to the volcano, and that's yeah. already seems like crazy yeah. OP. And like another thing they do with the ha uh, Kirby's power ups are hats, right? But they don't change his skin tone. Normally, when you have like the freezing power up, he turns blue. He's still pink. That's fucked up. I was I was crying. That's not my Kirby. It is my Kirby. I just have to get used to it. It's a frightening new world, bro. Yeah, they just stuff like that really shook me to my core. Yeah, yeah, they're they're fucking with the formula on a fundamental level. Yeah. Um, Kirby has the mouthful mode that is to about six or seven common objects that you will go through. Might it be a bit higher than that? Because I feel like I've already come across so many of them. Yeah, um, I know they reuse the cone, but they'll use it. Sometimes it's a traffic cone, sometimes it's uh, an ice cream cone at the theme park level. Um, but they're all cones. Yeah, they're cones. Um, I, I think my favorite one is still, he just swallows a ring, but it turns him into like an air zooka. That's fucking amazing. And he just blasts like a, like a sharp gust of air, but then he jumps into an empty boat, and all of a sudden he's the like wind-powered engine And like the animation when he does his little, like his, Neve, he's like, stretched around like a disc shaped object and when you fire him his like his back puffs yeah, outward back. and then snaps oh, wow. forward and it's, it's... And it just yeah just like just this cone of air this like cylinder of air yeah there's less levels in this than a traditional kirby game but those levels have so many collectibles have you I, beaten it i've beaten the main game now i'm in the post game how but, long would you say is it um it's fairly short you could like you could beat the main story in like five or six hours cool because each world is about an hour or i so. don't i don't need it to be longer than that yeah um, the bosses start repeating themselves. It definitely feels like that thing they always do in these Kirby games where you're going to fight the boss again, but he's a different color and he's mm. called like Phantom version or like Twilight version or some shit like that. And it's just, it's a reskin. Sometimes they have a new phase, which is interesting. And they are definitely much like this game actually gets pretty hard towards the end. Really interesting. Yeah. And I actually have to switch to, switch to Spring Breeze mode, mode, which is the easy mode because I was having t a tough time at one of the bosses. For the most part, it stays very grounded, which is nice, because the last couple of Kirby games have been very um, space, astral, and uh, you're going and fighting demons from other dimensions. This gets into that towards the end, but for the most part, it's actually more grounded in, uh, like, like yeah, it, it, it takes place on the Forgotten Lands, and I like that about it. It's a, it's a charming game, and I'm uh, someone who didn't really enjoy Star Allies, even though the fan service was 100% in that game. It just wasn't satisfying to play. It just felt like you're going through the motions. This game has me thinking. Cool. I'm, I'm very much enjoying it. And I like the hub world. I like the mini games. Uh, I've rescued a lot of Waddle Dees, and they've set up loads of little shops. I've done a Coliseum. Um... When you beat a bunch of bosses, they end up hanging out in the town as well. Everyone's having a great time. I did fishing. I caught a big fish. Does it, this rank high for you in terms of Kirby games so far? It's in my overall top five Kirby games. For Ooh, sure. Oh, that's pretty good. Because there's high. like 60 fucking yeah. Kirby games. Yeah. A lot of those Kirby games aren't very good. Like, they're good, but they're not. What's your top them. five, Brian? My favorite game ever by Kirby himself. The Smash Bros. Ultimate Count. No. No. Okay, yes. it has to be a Hal Laboratory Kirby game. Okay, I really like Kirby Superstar, aka Kirby Fun Pack, which is the one we did the Let's Play of a couple That's years ago. That's the one? Yeah. Terrible game. Love that game so much. The good, good game was just terrified playing it. Uh, Brian and Neil's favorite game. <laughs> <laughs> then I really like Kirby Planet Robobot. Yeah, people love that game. That's a fantastic game. I really like Dreamland 2. I really like Kirby's Adventure, which is the NES game. Dreamland 2 is the Game Boy game. Then, yeah, uh, Kirby in the Forgotten Land has to be in the top five. It might work its way up into the top three. Whoa. Wow. So this is a real winner for the Kirby fans. Absolutely. I just like how reduced but also focused it is. 
at the same time. Like, they've decided to do a smaller cross-section, but make it more detailed. These games, if I'm told correctly, have a habit of getting, like, pretty wild in the final boss fight. Yeah. This... Uh, it's wild. It's, it's less wild than previous games. Okay. They put but... a really sexy cat in this one, Neve. I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, God, there's some weird furry stuff in this game. But I guess it's because you're in the land of the beasts. I'm still working on this theory because I don't know, but I get the feeling that the Forgotten Land is actually still Dreamland and you're still on Planet Popstar. You just got teleported into the future and it's like Planet of the Apes. You and Willie need to get in a call and crunch some numbers. Yeah, because... Uh, so he was on Planet Popstar all along? Yeah. Was... That's dark. Yeah, because like... They're definitely leaning in in terms of like Nier Automata where like this is a forgotten land yeah. and it's the name of the game. It's the name of the game. But like, you know, like it, it, it has the overgrown vegetation. It's crazy to see and, uh, and, yet and the animals. another game that outdoes Nier Automata of what it does. <laughs> it's so weird that it has the abandoned theme park. <laughs> There's one really good level in the abandoned theme park where you're going through like half of it is like laser tag and the other half of it is haunted house. Where it has like the glow in the dark neon stuff, but like it's such a fun level, and Kirby swallows a light bulb, and you have to use that to navigate through the pitch black. Oh, that's pretty fun. And um, it just has all these like stupid haunted house scares, uh, but it has like the cool like arcade floor pattern on it. It's the same with the mall, like they've really captured like a late 80s mall frozen in time with like and like all oh, the food in the game looks so nice. There's also a mall in near. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it is just near Automata. It's kind of like, I'm pretty sure they played it and they were like, which is the better game? There's no way to tell. It's definitely near. <laughs> it might be Kirby though. <laughs> Someday I'll replay Automata. You mentioned the theme park and I'd forgotten about the theme park and for a moment there was something inside my head. <gasps> the music in the theme park. Yeah, yeah that was so, so good. Those little twinkly little sound, little sound effects. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. That roller coaster when it the goes. The roller coaster is so good. <laughs> And, and the change way, perspective. And the way, if you want to go back to that one space, you need to go on the roller coaster and jump off at a certain time, and then you got that shortcut set up. But it's not really a shortcut, but you do it. It is. It's kind of handy. You know what else is kind of handy? Lego Star Wars. The Skywalker okay, Saga. I literally just put this in the console and put on Episode One. So this is like game the best one. So it, well, does does this game bring you into like a menu of like nine games? It brings you into a menu of nine games, but you can only pick the first of all the trilogies. That's a good so idea. That's clever. Yes, yeah, yeah. so you can pick. You can start off with any trilogy, but you can't skip to the second movie in it. So that's fair. Yeah. So I went straight to Phantom Menace. It starts you on the original trilogy, but I was just like, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta Not find for it. Neve. <laughs> Gotta find out what happened to him. Well, it's chronological anyway. Like, why wouldn't I? And it was nice to go from like Elden Ring to like some literal baby food but <laughs> but I've played a few Lego Star Wars and and this one is different in the sense that this one is behind the shoulder so it's kind of like an like an action game like a, I think it's like a totally new engine wow you can tell and not sometimes in good ways and sometimes in not so good ways I, I've seen some of the cutscenes in Endor and they don't look nice yeah so like but then other stuff looks great so playing this is quite fun because it's like it's Lego Star Wars and you're just like knocking the shit out of everything and the little Lego yeah, coins. Those are... games are so charming. Yeah, and I I played a lot of the original Lego Star Wars like um, Phantom Menace on the Xbox original and then like the other ones on the 360 and stuff like that. And there was never to me this jarring moment between Lego and real world, but this because of the engine, everything looks hyper realistic and then there's bits of Lego in it. And then it doesn't feel like a Lego world. It Wait, feels like a so, world with Lego in it. So everything's not made out of Lego. Mm, 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 mm. No. Ah, There's doing? very little what, what Lego we, what are we in doing? this Lego what, world. What, what is this? But like, in fairness, it has always been this way. But yeah, in the other lo, lo, games... Like, like they've had domes and stuff, but they've yeah. always been like the on model domes more yeah. or less like okay. like the ships are made of lego maybe the the walls aren't lego kind of thing okay, there's lego sure. blocks that you can break but in the older games there was a definitely a better blend between the lego and the real the other the other bits of the world do you think it's that they have the power now to go more realistic i think it's just honestly because i went back and looked at kind of references stuff in this because like i was on naboo and i love naboo like it's a great planet it's fucking cool and I was really excited to be on Naboo. It's got a lot of decoration. And there's, 
a little potted plant with Lego flowers out of it. And I was like, cool, Lego flowers. But they're right next to planted flowers that are just rendered hmm. realistically. And I was like, don't put them right next to each other. That's so jarring. So I went back to the original Phantom Menace Lego game and they have the potted Lego flowers and that's fine. There is real flowers, but they are only on the trellises and they are never near the Lego flowers. And those real flowers are all purple, like a bright purple, and they're dotted around very specifically. Interesting. So there's like an artistic touch gone into building the levels where the Lego is complementary to the other stuff in it. This is not this at all. It kind of feels like you took a like a battlefront map and then put some Lego here and there. Yeah. And it looks kind of ugly. There's some times when this games look nice. There's other times when it just looks really, really ugly. Dog shit ugly, some might say. Honestly, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> and like, and that's kind of disappointing to me because I've never noticed the disconnect so much as to this. Because now it just feels like there's like little Lego people in a real world situation and it's not very Lego-y. And I say this as someone who builds Lego Star Wars as well. There's people out there and... I've been shared loads of videos. Thank you to the person on Twitter who shares me. Hope all the Les- Lego mocks, they know who they are. Lesbian. Yeah, she nearly said it. <laughs> <laughs> but there's people out there who make Always Lego the mind, mocks oh, yeah. for literally everything. Everything in Star Wars has been made in Lego. Those designs yeah, exist. Mm. People have done it. In this game, there is a physical tree. There is Lego trees. They exist. Just, Just make it a fucking Lego tree. <laughs> And like that is like a little frustrating to me. Yeah, some of this sounds like a I don't know, dude. It's due at the end of the week. Fucking put it in there. Yeah, and this game, another thing on this, this like it came out a big like expose about all the crunch that happened really? on this game. Oh, shit. Yeah. Okay. So like, like I'm not like saying give these people more work. Cause... That's what you're saying? Are these <laughs> some lazy fucking get? No, not no, I don't think laziness exists. This is this is a design decision that wasn't maybe thought through or they didn't really like it looks nice as a realistic thing but with the lego maybe looks a bit weird and again this is bothering no one else i haven't seen this come up in any reviews i was just playing it and i was just like why is there a lego flower next to a real flower like what is going on i think anyone who's been listening to this podcast long enough will know how that is a very specific blend of problems that's really specifically will irritate you. I'm an environmental artist. It's something like yeah. that will always bother me. No, but like it's legit. And I think, I honestly think that's the kind of thing that would bother everyone. I just don't think a lot of people would know how to articulate it. Because mm-hmm. you'd just be like, there is some... Hmm. Something a bit weird yeah. about the universe. Um, other than that, uh, it is going on in a very quick pace. Like I started the game and 15 min- minutes later, I was in Naboo. Like it is going, it went through the Gungan village. Yeah. It went through everything super, super fast. Wow. The the longevity it's in this game. It's a very abridged version of the series. Yeah. And uh, and yeah, it's got some good cutscenes where, yeah, they just sort of fast track it and take the mm-hmm. piss out of it at the same time. The longevity in this game is going around and finding the collect- collectibles. I find the menus are actually quite sloppy and difficult to use. Um, For a while, I was running around with two Jar Jars. I was just Qui-Gon with two Jar Jars because I accidentally switched out my Obi-Wan. Can't wait to play this Jar Jar. (laughs) And I just felt really bad for Qui-Gon. This is like voice acted where usually they aren't voice acted. And it sounds like people putting on voices. So they're doing the inflections of like like Qui-Gon Jinn might do and kind of stuff like that. And it's like, oh, maybe... Maybe that doesn't sound brilliant, but it's not bad either. It's kind of interesting. A couple of this game's problems seem to be from that it has like not too much production, but it's like nearly it it has more resources, but not enough resources. It's like it has. And it's like all these halfway problems. Yeah, it's like loads more resources, loads more ideas, but like maybe the like not enough control by an art director or like an overseer for like sure. design stuff specifically. There's a, there's loads of little Easter eggs if you're Star Wars fans you'll like come up with s- stuff against that. I like that the front, um, the very s- the splash image like Leia has this little cocked eyebrow and she's sitting right in the middle, um, and Poe and Finn have their arms around each other and I was just like braver than Disney. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, I'm I'm excited to play through it all. Uh, I'm liking it and it is fun. <laughs> I don't know. A part of me is just like, was I just a child? And was the original ones better? 
but I'm I'm still liking it. Like I bought this game because uh, Sunshi Legend on Twitter posted a video of Anakin like juggling some younglings, and um, <laughs> that's pretty good. And I was just like, that's cool. Like yeah. someone on that team gets it. That's that's canonically what happens. Yeah, he juggled the shit out of those kids. Skywalker, <laughs> oh, you're going in the air. Um, so yeah, I'll play some more. But um, the main thing that stood out to me was the environments. It's Wrestle Talk again. Yep, I played WWE 2K22. Uh, Long time listeners of the podcast will remember that on the last episode, I was like, "I'm not buying this fucking game." Well, guess who got all hopped up on wrestling after WrestleMania and made a bad decision? Is this a recent game? Did this come out the end of last year? This came out in the last, like, two months. They had two years on this one, didn't they? Yeah. Okay, Uh, WWE WWE 2K20 was a game that everyone is familiar with because of how disastrously full of glitches that game was. I keep meaning to buy a physical copy, disconnect my PlayStation from the internet, and stream it because it just looks like... It looks like inside a Vince McMahon nightmare. Like, I think I think WWE 2K20 is how the world actually looks to Vince McMahon. Um, but this is a game that they... They were kind of... Like, it's weird. In the actual advertising, like, in WWE, they're like, We've got a new game engine! And it's like, they knew how badly that last one was received, and they really seemed to want to try and fix it. And, you know, this is a pretty okay wrestling game. And that's a huge deal because wrestling games have been terrible for multiple decades now. This is all right. It's it's like reasonably fun. It it feels it feels janky. It it's not. Sometimes you'll like line up a big hit and go for it, and you'll just float through the other person, and you're like, okay. <laughs> but then like there's a lot. There is cool stuff about it as well. And um, the creator wrestler is fucking insane. That's always the fun part. Yeah, and like just a lot of different stuff you can do. Um, I made a wrestler. Who'd uh, you make? Uh, Dr. Grapple. He's an evil surgeon. You know, you go in and it's like, I want to give him an ankle lock. And there's literally like nine different ankle locks you can give him. Cool. And I love that so much because I'll go through each one and I'll decide which one suits the personality of Dr. Grapple the most. It takes, like no joke, three or four hours to make a wrestler. Just in the character creator screen or just in the... Between the character creator screen and the move set, there is like hundreds of scenarios that you need to pick a move for. So like it's everything from like what happens when you hit strike, then like what happens when you hit, you know, direction and strike, what happens when you hit down and strike, all the way to what happens when you're in a mixed tag match and you and your partner do a move at the same time. Do you have to make your own wrestler for story mode, or do you... yes? Wow. Okay. So yeah. it's part of the game. Yeah, I made um made this really sick skeleton looking dude, and he had a skull for a face, and I, I called him Knife Face, and um, then they showed him in like civilian clothes in like a, a button up shirt, and I was oh, like, Oh no, Knife Face would never wear this. It's weird that they didn't let you pick that. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was, I was a little bothered to be honest with you. But um, it's really cool. You can't make boys and girls fight each other. I feel like that's like 50% of the reason you buy a wrestling game. So I don't know what the fuck that's about. I think they should change that. So but, that means so many matches can't happen. Yeah. Does that mean there's like, for the story mode, they have to do like two They have story done modes? two entirely separate story modes. Holy shit. For the men's league and women's yeah. league. I guess they don't want Roman Reigns like beating up a woman, but fuck it who gives a shit it's a yeah. game it's fine Sixteen of the clown wants to fight oh roman reigns God, 16 of the clown at wrestlemania <laughs> i want to see what 16 of the clown win the royal rumble and i want to see everyone so horrified like every time she eliminates someone they're outside on the mat and they're just vomiting <laughs> i didn't know 16 was a wrestler this brings a whole new dimension <laughs> to her character is anything you need her to be it's a very active woman i think i'm falling in love with this fictional let's fight a boss character Anyway, it's fun. It's it's like it's like a good wrestling game. And I'm only a little bit of the ways into the career mode, but the way you can be a dick is really weird and funny. Like I've seen some videos. There's one part where you're fighting Rey Mysterio, and you can choose to do Eddie Guerrero's entrance. 
For people who are not familiar with Eddie Guerrero, he was one of Rey Mysterio's best friends and a very cool wrestler who died. So you can just choose to mock Rey Mysterio by imitating Eddie Guerrero's entrance. And it's like, wow, they're going all in on this shit. And I think it's cool. But yeah, it seems like a fun game. Neve. Yes. I've been I've been really dying to hear about Weird West from you. What is Weird West? What is it? <laughs> so Weird West is a game that is on Game Pass, and that is how I'm playing it. Um, I've been excited for this game for ages because it's like X, like um, Dishonored and Prey devs making a immersive sim that's a Western. And this is an action role-playing, isometric, top-down kind of game. I haven't played too much of it because Elden Ring has kind of consumed my life. It'll do that. And you start off with one character, but you can play as five. And throughout the story, you will be going into different characters' life. Regrettably, I think you probably start as the blandest one. Um, She's a bounty hunter called Jane. And it starts with her husband being kidnapped and her boy being dead as shit. He's just (laughs) outside the house and he's dead. I like how you put it as her boy. Her Her boy is dead. You took my boy. I watched some westerns as well at the weekend, so I'm in in the right right mindset to say boy. But um, so Jane, the old cow um, bounty hunter, she has to dig up her irons in the back of the garden. That's cool. Because she needs to go on a, a rampage to basically get back her husband because she thinks he might be still alive and avenge her boy. You didn't get to see this kid alive, so I didn't really care too hard about him dying. Uh So there is a role-playing aspect to this game, but like so far I'm not like, like, they're like, oh, go get your husband. And I'm like, eh, I don't see her with a husband. (laughs) I'm not like, I'm not doing it very fast. And with my boy, I got a shovel from the shed and like, I, I picked a nice place to bury him. Well, that's something. Yeah, so I was just like, I'll roleplay a little and like I'll bury my kid somewhere nice. And I dug up my irons and my iron is called like Old Blue. And I go into town and everyone's like, it's it's crazy to see you in in your cowboy gear again and you're going on your hip. They to- stole a whole pile of people of the village. You need, a, you need to go help us out and track down who's done this. And you get a few side quests where a woman's like, my husband was taken by the same guy who took you, people who stole your husband. So I'm on a man-finding mission and you go out into the world and it's an overworld map full of icons. And I click on the next icon and there's a little walking animation. So it shows like, it's just like a graphic that plays. Sure, yeah. But along the line, you can click anywhere on the map and you will set up camp and it'll create a little box diorama area for you to hunt um, wildlife. Maybe there's some bounty hunters there. Maybe you'll meet someone selling goods or whatever. All fine and good. That's kind of how this kind of plays out. So I click on the next area on the map where I need to go and deal with these bandits that have kidnapped my husband. It is a twin stick shooter. I, I was really surprised when I heard that. Yeah. And this is a thing I'm finding a bit of difficulty with. It doesn't feel great. I'm playing this on console. I feel like I'm trying to aim and like I set up my perfect shot. Then all hell will break loose when you get into a gunfight. And it is hectic. And that twin stick shooting is just sliding all over the place. So you can die like just like that. And it never feels like because of bad planning, it feels like that is like very difficult shooting. Yeah. Because these are guns that are 150 years old. They, they wouldn't be rapid fire like... A... No, you can upgrade your gun and stuff to give it stuff like rapid fire or three spread bullet kind of stuff like yeah. that. But it's like, it's it's not that it's like shooting like loads. You still have like an, an ammo count. So you have like, a, like your shotgun might, you might have a two uh, shot shotgun and you might upgrade that to a five. You might get another one that has five... Uh, rounds in it. Yeah, because like, so cause like to me, a twin six shooter, you're constantly. It's a bullet s- hell kind yeah, of thing. And, and yeah, and you're steering that strafe constantly. Yeah, yeah. I think and you the, don't the let finic- go of the yeah, fire. Yeah, the finickiness of a twin, of like an actual stick, is fine if you're firing an infinite amount yeah. of yeah. geometry wars yeah, or yeah. something. You're just you're constantly rotating that that aim. Yeah, no, this you're trying to get that one shot with that kind of twin stick thing. Don't mm. love that. And I feel like I've now started playing in a game where I'm always kind of walking backwards to kind of like compensate to line it all all the way up all the time. But because it's an immersive sim, you can kind of go about things your own way. And I'm doing air bunny quotes with this because so far the only 
other way I've found to engage with things is setting everything on fire like either yeah, blowing shit up or setting it fire and yeah. I don't think you can call it like and it is an immersive sin and I know I'll probably come up with other like situations to it but right now you're the, not resolving uh, shit with dialogue yeah I haven't resolved anything with dialogue right now my other way of resolving shit is like burning a building down or burning people or blowing up people or kicking a barrel of dynamite into a group of people and shooting that and having them blow up in fire like I feel like fire is my best friend so I'm Fire's compensating him for my shitty shooting, kind of like Tunic. Like, I'm compensating for the battle system by just blowing everything that shit up. And that's quite fun. Sounds <laughs> it. Yeah, it's just like once I see a barrel, which they give you a lot. How's uh, the writing? I'm very early on in Jane's story, and it feels very like your husband's stolen and your boy is dead. Kind of feels a bit generic so far. Yeah. I have met the people who were responsible for stealing my husband and it kind of got a little weird part of the weird west there because they were a group of bounty hunters who have set up a deal with cannibalistic monsters that are basically like you need to deliver us people or we will eat you sounds like kind of a weird way oh mm. there you go and that's kind of fun yeah. yeah I've met these monsters I used fire to kill them like I did with the men <laughs> I met some like witches I used fire to kill them, like <laughs> I did with the men. Oh. <laughs> Witches don't like fire. Um, so I'm like, I'm having fun going through these little locations and like, you know, they're like, they're all very, like, they're kind of different. Sometimes the visuals are a little muddy, but it's like, it's engaging. Like I spent a long time playing, playing it. Cause like when you do kind of figure out what you want to do with a system and like, even if I am using fire, there might be like 20 people on a map. Like this, so far the stuff I like doing the most are the bounty hunters where I have to track down one person. There might be this guy and he's 20 other people. I can't set them all on fire. So, <laughs> so I might have like, I have upgraded my character to have a nail bomb. So I might put that one end, put a whole pile of barrels on another end there's a door I can go in through. That sounds pretty fun. Yeah, and yeah. I can funnel them in through the door, and then the ones that come around by the side get nail bombed. The other ones that come around the other, through the other side, I can shoot that barrel and blow them the fuck up. And that stuff is fun. That sounds cool. Yeah. So the combat does get really meaty when a lot of shit starts sparking off. And I think the more I will go through it, I will get into bigger, weirder situations, given what the game is. And I know the next character that I've up is a pig man, and I know there's a werewolf. Oh, so maybe, <laughs> yeah. maybe starting with the the like kind of plain Jane cowboy. Um, as much as I think it's cool to play as her, um, compared to pig man and werewolf, eh? Yeah, yeah. I I want to know what that pig man can do. Yeah, dialogue options wise, they haven't been a lot or that interesting. I think the big issue so far for me is. I was playing this game for 20 minutes and I to an hour and I spent 40 of those minutes dealing with my inventory. You have to pick up everything to sell it because you need money to buy a horse, you need money to buy healing items, you need money to hire two AI companions to help you shoot. They're kind of useless, mm. but you can hire them and they will die and then you just hire another man. A man is a hundred dollars in this. One man, please. Yeah, and you can, and the game is really like, don't get too attached, they will die. So it's very like, <laughs> they will die. So you have to pick up everything, but you only like have 40 spaces and that accounts for everything. They don't stack? They don't, like, they don't, they, they stack like some items, but like there is so much shit. Like you're ending up like picking up empty cans, you got your guns, your, like your, your, your armor and your guns and your empty cans and your dynamite are all in the same box kind okay. of thing and yeah. take up those same 40 slots my 40 slots were so full and i need that gold to hire people you can get more spaces by getting a horse but you need to buy a horse with 250 gold when i finished the first mission i got a cipher that would tell me where to go next but to get that translated i need to play a cipher cracker 300 gold oh. so it's all very managing this but i don't have a lot of space so I'm trying to think about like, oh, is this good? But I'm on, I'm in the middle of a mission. I know I'm going to get more stuff. So you're kind of like, like you end up with 20 guns. They're, like you're breaking them down and you're like, maybe I should be selling these. Your inventory is just packed. It's just throwing junk at you constantly to the point that at the start of the game, you have your wedding band in your inventory. And I picked up a blue teddy that belonged to my boy. 
I fucking got rid of that blue teddy so quickly because it was taking up a slot that I could use for a dirty sock to sell for eight gold. Wow, okay, <laughs> interesting. My wedding band, I went back to the house and like I was like, oh, I could sell this, I'll just like leave it in the house. I don't know if it's still there, like I don't know if I can pick it up again, like I was trying to leave it back in a place. And it's just like, my gun that I had, my old blue, which every character's like, it's weird to see all blue on you again. I accidentally dismantled it because I'd up <sighs> I had picked a better gun and it was taking up space and I was just dismantling like 20 other weapons and it was just at the end of it and it didn't look any different except that it was called Old Blue. I dismantled her like special gun. I always feel weird about that in games when you get like a story weapon and then you pick up something in a treasure chest in a sewer and it's way better. Yeah. It's like that in the Persona games with your main Persona and you're I like... I never know what to do with <laughs> that. Like, Fuck that mm. thing. You gotta get other Personas. I always keep it to the end because I'm always like, well, there's gonna be something cool that... And then I'm on the final boss fight. I'm like, fuck this thing. Yeah, it's yeah. just been hanging around the whole time. So it's a role-playing game where the sentimentality I was trying to project onto this character is a hindrance to me so I fucking sell it mm. you know and I accidentally break my sentimental gun as well because I'm just like getting rid of loads of junk in my inventory so the big kind of thing I'm not loving so far is this inventory system I'm just picking up so much junk and I don't have the space for it right you sound kind of mixed on it but it, it sounds kind of cool I'm excited to see where it goes with the different characters and as the world opens up and gets weirder. Um, and I hope it does. And I hope I can set more things on fire. Cool. You know what else we can set on fire? What? Quick time events. Did you say strategy talk? Do you want to say it again? We said strategy talk at the beginning of the strategy talk section. We said quick time events at the beginning of the quick time events section. What's this section? Quick time Brian, this is like our 200th fucking episode of this. 160 seconds. Okay, so when we talk about media, that's called a quest lock. Yeah, yeah. but now we, we've, we've, do, we've, we've done this bit many times also. The podcast? No, the bit where we say what's strategy. Sony announces three tier PS Plus service to launch in June. Cool. Do you ever see a major corporation announce like a huge avenue of their business but feel weirdly begrudging about it? They're like, fucking fine. Yeah. Well, what, what, where are I going to charge you through the nose for it? I'm, I'll probably just stick with the basic. I like the cloud saving a lot. Mine never works. I always get an error. Really? Yeah. I think, Neve, since you told me that you lost your Mass Effect save with cloud saving, mm -hmm. I've never done it. I just, I don't trust it. Sometimes I can use it in other games. It's just like every time I turn on the PS5, it's just like there's been an error with your alien colonial, like not colonial marines, fire team elite hmm. save. It just, it doesn't do it. That's, that's, that's troublesome. I use cloud saving on Nintendo Switch online all the time and I've never had any You're such a brave boy. Yeah. Because I, I jump between the two switches because one of my switches is, con it's, it's television only. Because it's not like you can take it out of the system and play it handheld. That's why I have the Switch Lite. <laughs> I'm not an idiot. Anyway, uh. as someone who is very consumer savvy, I'm not going to be paying the higher premium. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, what the second tier is the one that has... Um, That's more or less what we're in right now. Where you get your free game every month? Yeah. I, I think the lowest tier has a free game, but it's not all the free games. Okay. I think, that, like, the tier I would be interested in is, like, the PlayStation 1, 2, 3 stuff, but they haven't announced any games for that. Yeah, they just said beloved titles. I would like to know what those beloved titles were. Yeah, because if it's Uncharted 1. Yeah. <laughs> Like, don't care. Give me Vibramen. I like that PS1 and PS2 games, like, the, you can obviously download them. I would hope that if they're going to do the work with these games, that you'll be able to just buy them outright and they won't be tied to this service. Yeah. But I presume they will be. I would say, like, it would be not in the interests of this service to do that. But I still think that's possible because I don't get the feeling Sony is, like, pumped to be doing this. No. Like, there are certain games on the PS3 that are stuck on the PS3, like Metal Gear Solid 4 or Tokyo Jungle. If there was just, like, a way to hard download them to your new system and just play them nice and easy, I would. All the PS3 is, like, cloud stuff. Yep. Because of that architecture. 
which is disappointing. I was listening to Grub Snacks, and they were, um, and Jeff Grub was. I love Grub Snacks. Yeah, it's great. He was like saying that there's rumors that they are trying to develop like an emulator, but maybe because we're in like this kind of half step between keeping the PS4 relevant, that they're not going to announce any PS5 specific stuff. Yeah. So maybe it will come in the future. I also like what you're saying. They don't seem too pushed about this shit. Yeah. It feels very like responsive, and it's like, hey. You know that thing you wanted to say, well, we're, we're fucking doing it. Um, I don't know what games we have for it. Maybe some, maybe some. And it's like, you know, because think if there's anything you admire about Game Pass, it's how just 100% all in on it, x way. It's like, oh, you know, they have all these titles, every first party title. And like the, you know, they, someone asked Phil Spencer, I think it was, about like, are Sony first party titles going to appear? And he gave the most fucking flowery corporate answer of like, you know, we have this virtuous way of making games. But like, are, are they going to have original Silent Hill? Are they going to have Guitar Man? Are they going to have Parappa the Rapper? Are they going to have Gregory See, Horror Show? They're going to have weird shit like that. That's how you get me. But I don't think they give a shit about that. Like, I really, I do not think they're going to do the are work they to have get Hurdy Gurdy Horror Show. Yeah. Hurdy Gurdy. Oh, Brian, you know how Hurdy Gurdy is. Uh, I hope they have Demolition Girl. Is that the one with the giant it's kaiju? The one you got me for my birthday, yes. Yeah, the big bikini girl who's mm-hmm, a kaiju. Mm-hmm. Just weird shit like that. Yeah, because like there's so much of that shit trapped, trapped on like PlayStation. But here, and like here's the thing, PlayStation Two emulation's real fucking good now. Mm. Like you can get all that shit, and like. I'm not saying that like people should automatically go over that stuff. I'm saying Sony should be making the effort to try and beat yeah, that. Because the that. only way you beat that stuff is with like a good service. Did you kind of see some of the previews of the Chrono Cross like remaster? Kind of rough. Yeah. And like I bought like um, Grandia 1 and 2 HD remaster as well. Kind of rough. And yeah, it's just like. I, I was watching Rebecca play them and she kind of fell off them. If you're putting out like like full price remasters that are like really shoddily done and there's a better emulated version of that, it's really like. You're kind of asking for these yeah. games to be emulated. And I, I just feel like, just give me a reason to support this shit. Because like, I, I want those games to be preserved. I want yeah. to see them again. Don't make pirating it seem appealing. Mm-hmm. And like, look. I'm 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 gonna like I I believe in emulation 100. percent I don't think melt or I don't think ill bleed is getting a HD remaster anytime soon. I'm fucking downloading that shit, and you know the way retro like the retro market has gone as well. Yeah, you know, the prices are insane. I I was outside CEX uh, at lunch and they were selling a complete unboxed copy of Pokemon Heart Gold for the DS. That's the one with the Poke Walker as well. Mm. 185 euro. What the fuck? Mad. It's, that that it's thing crazy. sold for 40 euro back in 2008, 2009. Yeah. Maybe Sony will make us eat our words, but nothing about this announcement got me excited and I was looking forward to this for a while. I think I like the idea of like the PS1, PS2 and PSP catalog, not Vita, PSP yeah. <laughs> catalog um, being there for download and streaming, but like I don't know, the price they're offering that this, it's just not competitive with something like Game Pass, so I'm probably going to just stay in the tier that I already yeah. am. With my- uh, I have two, like, Game Pass-ish services. I, I really don't need a third. Yeah, it'd be so. overwhelming, you won't have the time. Yeah. And maybe I barely like, have the time as is. Maybe over time they'll make it worth my while, but like currently as an announcement, it didn't light a fire under me, and it just made me go, can't wait for my Steam Deck to... <laughs> Look, emulate the I hope, PS2 I, games. I, I hope in a year's time we are eating our words. Like that yeah. to me is the best case scenario here. Me too. But I want to play Dragon Guard Tree. Yeah, god damn it. Maybe without the single digit frame rate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no E3 this year, but there are plans to return in 2023. And somewhere, Jeff Keighley becomes more Jeff Keighley. Did you see that this announcement went out and he like tweeted a winky smiley Such face? A <laughs> I like Jeff Keighley, I think he's alright. Um, so yeah, E3 is not happening physically or digitally this year. Can't believe we outlasted E3. Yeah, in yeah. the Venera. It's sad. I like E3. I like Me too. I like the hype. I like the I like the fun. Um I guess that's gonna be like Jeff Keighley's there to step into that. He does summer gap. games? Is that yeah, what it's he called? does the summer summer games. It's basically best. him directing internet traffic. Yeah. Yeah. Change of times. Yeah, change yeah. of times. Do you think E3 comes back? I think they try to come back. 
Yeah, I feel like you wouldn't want that name to go. Maybe it's something in a few years' time they can come back with a live show and I'd love the if they came back glory. and it was still like the Space World logo. Oh. That'd be so good. Um, yeah, I, I've seen a lot of people say like, okay, E3 is definitely dead. I really don't see that. I, I think they absolutely try and make it come back. And like the ESA, so much of their revenue was E3 that I can't... I just can't imagine there aren't at least a couple of people in that organization really fighting for it. I feel like they just, they need a per, they need their Keeley. They need the person with connections out there willing to make those deals and make them seem good and viable. Because from the sounds of it, the ESA kind of were like, you need us, come to us. Mm. They weren't out there pitching for shit, really. They were kind of, I think... They were a dinosaur organization that got very comfortable. Yeah, so maybe if they get some fresh blood in there with a new vision, it could be, but I don't yeah. know. And maybe someone who's not going to activate people in the queue. Mm-hmm. New Lara Croft Simulator, Neve, take it away. Yeah, Neve, what's this? This was a weird announcement because it was like a part of the Unreal 5 engine announcement. Yeah, it was announced. They just basically said that development is happening with Crystal Dynamics. They didn't show anything. They didn't. I hate those announcements because it's always for games that I'm like, yeah, of course you're going to make another Tomb Raider. But it didn't feel like they were because like they had done three. So the trilogy's wrapped up. She had become the Tomb Raider. <laughs> and I felt like what they were going to do is start like rebooting it just like reboot it or remaster one of the old ones do a complete remake of the original I guess what I mean is Lara. Tomb Raider at least for a long time I feel like is always going to be coming in some form yeah I think that IP so is too valuable I guess the fact that they are continuing the previous trilogy right that's what they're yeah, doing yeah it's like that, they're, it's that, Survivor I get how that's Lara. kind of a big deal yeah and especially because like they changed the ending in a patch of like what? Shadow of the Tomb Raider yeah where they had a different ending which kind of alluded to bigger machinations and then they kind of patched it and it was mm. just like I guess everything's wrapped up and we're done <laughs> oh that's weird yeah because yeah. the camera pans out and there's like a woman on a phone she's like yes I'm watching it right now yeah, it had like like it had like some lead in to what could happen next and they kinda got rid of that and like, you know, Square were always so squirrely about like, oh it's not doing well and it sucks and So I think know. I could write the next Tomb Raider game. Don't. <laughs> it'll it'll be good, okay. <laughs> Lara Croft really wants her dead dad's approval. <gasps> and so she tracks down a treasure that he was obsessed with, and then she gets it, but then the treasure is destroyed. But then she realizes that the memories of her dad are more valuable. Do you like that? How's that, Neve? Uh, she loves it! Um, thankfully, Rihanna Pratchett, who um, has been the writer on these games, has said that she wants to give Lara less father issues in the next game. Okay, I feel very uncomfortable. <laughs> Not none, just less. Because <laughs> we've had like a full trilogy of this shit that's so boring and like. Imagine, uh, imagine you get to the, the end. The Craft Manor legacy needs to continue. Imagine you get to the end of um, Gears of War and Marcus Phoenix looks into the sky and goes, Dad. It's for you, Dad. <laughs> I love you, Daddy. It's just like she can't do anything for herself. It's like, oh, it's so annoying. So, you three games in a movie that kind of followed that like really thin thin premise like super nothing to glom onto so i'm hoping with the idea of this of kind of lara has become the tomb raider <laughs> i hate saying that um that hopefully now we'll see like a car like a lara that maybe in like embodies survivor era lara, lara with original lara and she's like cockier and maybe she has her circle frames on and maybe she has the plat and stuff you know Maybe she's making some jokes. Maybe she can laugh. Because <laughs> she was kind of sassy in the original, original. Yeah, game, she was she? sassy. She was confident in the like, and like, I don't mind Survivor Lara. I think she's kind of weird and crazy, but I don't think that is her fault. I think it's riding around her having any real relationships. It's like they didn't want people shipping her with a girl, so they got rid of Sam. They don't want her shipping her with any guy. It's like she had to be. Virginal. Very sexless, yeah. yeah. So she couldn't have like interpersonal relationships and she only ever had Jonah and I think their idea with that is like, well we'll give also give Jonah a girlfriend and uh, so okay. she I like, think, yeah, I think just like they wouldn't they wouldn't date anyway. There's yeah. never been any Okay. I think they need to one eighty on that. I think in the new game mm -hmm. Lara needs to fuck literally everyone. Yes. Well I would like her to come out of a room like Cassandra and there's a bunch of girls there. <laughs> 
<laughs> do it. <laughs> okay, so my Lara Croft game is that uh, she's lobe trotting and she's looking for this treasure, but there's another treasure hunter out there. It's one of her old rivals from boarding school. <gasps> this bitch. Brian, that is the sexiest storyline. <laughs> she downs the Lucas Aid and she goes, I'm yes! <laughs> gonna fuck her shit up. And she gets in her motorcycle. And <laughs> yes, motorcycle. <laughs> yes, Brian. And goes off a ramp and is silhouetted in the moon. <laughs> But then the moon is actually one of her glasses and oh. it like fade transitions to her full head and goes, this is for you, Neve. Yes! Rihanna Pratchett, you can have that. <laughs> you can take that. You can do this. I just really want the Lucas 8 in there. It's important. Yeah. There's also a bit where she fights a skeleton. She goes, you shouldn't be alive. And the skeleton's like, uh-oh. And then just like turns to like, just bones. But yeah, they should bring a dinosaur back into it. Bring a tiger. <laughs> like, I want a bit where like a bear eats her, like a giant bear eats her, but then she punches the bear from the inside and busts out. I would also like um, Lara to start getting a bit more fashionable because she did have costume changes, but it's like she went to North Face and just like bought everything off the mannequin for her <laughs> snow, uh, snow items. Yes. And like original Lara, like she had different outfits and they, they were, were they cool. were cool. Like they were cool designs. Like I want her to wear like a feather jacket. Okay, Brian, you had a good run there for a yeah. bit, but um, <laughs> I, I think that's over it. now. I just want to wear a jacket with feathers on it and platform shoes. I, I think, like you know, like her, her even, back to shit, like her evening dress yeah. Yeah. was like really weird and fun. Mm -hmm. I want her to dress like the Spice Girls' wardrobe changes. He's back to brilliant again. I don't. That's what they used to. I just think they could have so much fun with this and like they they tried to do stuff in the last game where they talked about her being a white savior and about colonialism and about like missionaries and they were really trying but I think trying to talk about this while still having this white globe trotting millionaire stealing artifacts Belongs them, in a museum, Neve. <laughs> leaving them in her bedroom in a box of trash with some mix CDs. Like, it doesn't work, so maybe maybe just lean into the hilarity of it and not into trying to justify it, because you kind of can't. You I'd love can't. if there was an account where he's like, you're spending your father's millions going on these airplanes to the Alps just to find a tomb. And, and I'm doing, reading it. And she's doing a line of coke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Alfred, whatever. Oh, yeah. uh, what? <laughs> get, get down to the basement and we'll do some archery. It'll be fun. <laughs> that won't matter because Let's Fight a Boss is Game of the Year 2025. 2027. 2029. Yeah, come on. 2029, Kingdom Hearts 4. Sora's back, guys, and his feet are normal size this time. So were his feet always tiny in the big shoes? What's happening? Maybe he grew into them. <laughs> but no, because his feet sh shrank now. His feet are small now, and they were big. Is he barefoot in the beach at the beginning of the game? In the very first one? Yeah. No, he's got his clown shoes on. Jeez. But there is a moment where you see his normal feet where he phases through Roxas, I think, at some stage, if I'm remembering correctly. But I didn't think they were... They looked stylistically in keeping what... They looked bigger, I guess. Now, he's real human feet now. He's a real boy. Do you ever worry about like ending up on wiki feet? Do you have any pictures no, of your... Do you have any like... <laughs> no one will catch those things. Do you have any like stuff of your feet on the internet? No, despite the pleading of a very small but intense minority. Someday I'm going to see Neve's toes and I'm going to be... We've seen Neve's toes. Oh, you haven't no, we gone haven't, we haven't toes. seen her toes. Well, we've gone swimming with you. She didn't, mm, she didn't. didn't take her socks off. Weird. Why? It's private. It's private. I, I really want to see her toes. I don't know. I little waned it in the pool. She might have webbed toes, we don't They're know. They're just, just fucking feet, you know? She might have like seven toes. I might. I guess we'll never know. She could have like one giant toe. I'm just really afraid of them ending up on my feet. Neve, if we go to the beach, can can we all put our feet in the ocean? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> That's a weird way to ask this. I know, I know, feet. I know. The further <laughs> we got into that yourself. question, the more I was like, I don't like where this is going. This implies things that are not true about me. <laughs> Um, I just want to confirm you his toes. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't understand foot shit with people. And then a while ago, I was like, I wonder my own wiki feet. And then I was like, I should check. And then I was like, I should not check. And I didn't. You that's say sad. you don't that's... understand a lot, but I think you do. Really. You have no measurements or Someone anything. Someone once explained it to me as when they were little. 
<laughs> you know what? You know what? There's some shit we just don't need to get into. But no, I, no, I genuinely don't understand feet. I just don't get how they're a sensitive part of, of anatomy. They're just feet. They're just fucking hobbits have feet. Hobbits never wear shoes. Pretty good. And they are the sexiest creatures in Middle Earth. Yeah. No one's arguing that, Neve. Very, very sexually active folk. Well, no one, yeah, I know. I, I know hobbits fuck like crazy all the time, every day. But, yeah. I don't remember what we're Kingdom Hearts 4. Kingdom Hearts 4. Who gives a shit? I think it's like, what, the 20th year anniversary? And they, like, they released a poster and it was like Sora, like, flipping off some fingers where it was one, two, three, and there was like a gap for, like, the fourth one. And Whoa. then they dropped this trailer and then, like, that faded into the picture and then the full piece of artwork was released. This is the most PS2 ask fucking trailer. Like, it's real, like, we're gonna take our fictional character and put him in a realistic environment. Overcast skies. So, are, are, are the other human NPCs, like, hyper realistic? Are they. <sighs> They're wearing, like, fucking. Yeah, it's kind of the Fantasy VII remake and 15 problem okay, where yeah. Sora looks insane and everyone else is wearing. Shirt. They and just got back pants. from H and M. Yeah, yeah, like they just like they're they've just left work. Yeah, they're just plain clothes. And they're wearing their very plainest clothes. And the most interesting boy in the world <laughs> runs by. <laughs> yeah, he's just wearing like a studded jacket <laughs> yeah. with like the wind blowing. The boy who figured out hair gel and color <laughs> runs by. <laughs> um, and then like it, it like goes into this like cool animation of him running up buildings and stuff, and then it fades in the attack bar and the like. This is fucking horseshit, and you know how I know this is horseshit? Because Nomura has already made this trailer, and it was Final Fantasy XV. This trailer already happened, and it was Final Fantasy XV. All the fucking same shit is in there. Go watch the Leviathan fight. You know the way, like, a section of rectangular building comes and rotates around Sora as he goes through that? I saw that already! Five fucking years ago! I... It's just... Let it go, you fucking weirdo! Stop trying to make Versus 13! It's over! It's done! He has a very important story to tell that can only be told by a boy in three-quarter length pants. Okay, I want to get Nomura in a dark room, and I want to go, Nomura, let me show you something, and then I want the door to open and you, Suzuki, to walk in. Because that's what's happening! Don't become what you hate. Don't become me. Anyway, people were delighted to oh, see I'm this. Oh, I'm sure. And we'll probably, given the look at this trailer, I presume we'll see this in 10 years. It's kind so, of wild that they're, I'm, like, I'm, it's, like sure it's a it'll numbered be title. Misleading. Like, it's four, like, so, and not, like, a kind of spin off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, apparently, this was meant to be yeah, the Vernum Rex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, the, like, that's what I heard as well that it's, like, it was. Nomura was like, this is Vernum Rex. So is like Sora in this human world? Is this like not like part of the Kingdom Hearts world? I hope he goes so to Disneyland. Is that the like gimmick here that Sora's in our world? I think so. Who's paying his rent? He lives in Shibuya now. It's an incredibly expensive But then I've seen city. people say it's the world ends with you. Yeah. I don't know. I don't care. The, the Kingdom Hearts lore experts are going to have so much to chew on. Yeah. I hope and hey, a... hey, Kingdom Hearts fans, delighted for you. Don't, yeah, oh, don't, yeah. don't take this as dismissal of the thing you love. This is Rad. just confusion. It's just, we're, we're very old and we're very outside this. It'd be cool if you walked like 30 minutes north of Shibuya, ended up in Kabukicho, and it's like, oh, I hear you're pretty tough. And secure you. I think he's going to meet Loot Skywalker instead. It's pretty tough. People have figured out there's an ATST foot in one of the stills, and they're like, "This is Endor." Is that definitely an ATST foot? It looks like one. Are okay. Donald and Goofy in this? They're, yeah, they're, they're in they the pop trailer. in at the end of the trailer. I, I thought like... Go I thought Donald died. That's all I fucking heard about Kingdom Hearts Three that Donald <laughs> dies. Is Mickey gonna be in this? Yeah, I presume so. I think it's I... called the search for the master. Maybe he's the master. I don't know. I feel like the Vernum Rex dudes might like come in and like take be the main focus of the story instead of. Wow, Sarah. that sounds like literally the worst thing ever. Mickey Mouse is gonna be hundred years old in two thousand twenty-eight. Just trying to. Add Why do you know that? Because uh, that's that's the kind of fact. Because that we I... have degrees in animation, Neve. 
<laughs> yeah, it's my fault for not knowing. He turns Steamboat on. Willie <laughs> came out approximately September 1928. We all know this. <laughs> okay. My bad. I'm sorry. I don't know that, and I've I've said that line in video essays. <laughs> I don't know. My, do any of you guys have this thing where? Yeah, it's called a podcast, and I don't remember any of it. Your your brain learns things and then immediately just crunches them up and and just throws them away. Oh yeah, I become an expert at something for exactly like three hours from wiki searching, and then like <laughs> two minutes later, I'm like. What? Okay, okay. Last <laughs> night, thinking? last night I learned how to do a diamond shoelace tying technique. Couldn't do it tonight. <laughs> okay, so it's it gets really bad for me. I think I might have talked about this before, but I was picking out a suit for an event, and Michelle was there, and I was like, "Oh, cool! I'm gonna be able to wear this to this wedding that we have to go to." And she looks at me and she's like, "Are you joking?" And I was like, "No." And she's like. John, we went to that wedding last October, and this was this was one of my cousin's wedding. Um, it's no, there's no way it's the, any of the cousins who might hear this. Just just to clear that up, but I was like, no, we fucking didn't. And he's like, yeah, and I was like, seriously? And this wedding? This happened six months ago. No, it, it this happened a couple of years ago. Oh, okay. This wedding was such a non-event in my mind that eventually I was like. So I don't have to go to this wedding because in my <laughs> mind, I never did. I never had to fucking go. But yeah, that's what my brain does to memories that I don't think matter. Kingdom Hearts 4. Does it matter? <laughs> Probably not. Um, you know what? When a Kingdom Hearts game comes out, it's always a wild time on the internet. So I look forward to that. I have a feeling I'm probably going to play this game. Because that just feels like something that'll happen. You It'll be, be in my life in some capacity. Uh, yeah, well, are, are, are you, are you going to try and be tree in anticipation of it? Never. You're just going to start from four I'm done and with just tree. fill in the gaps. Yeah. I told you guys this before the podcast, but um, I got to the bit in three where Nomura was like, but what about versus 13? And I just got, I just felt sad. Just felt sad. His Final Fantasy VII drawings are so good. How old is he? I need to know when he's going to retire. Never. Never. He he's 51. Yeah, he's got plenty of time left. Yeah. He's going to be a creative fellow. <laughs> That's a very important job. Very important job. You know what else is a very important job? Answering emails. Ask let's fight a boss at gmail.com. I got some emails lined up. Brian, let's take temperature. How has the recent quality of emails been? You know what? Fine. Sounds like people need to step it up. They do? Now I can confirm we're not wanting for quantity. I want quality. Yeah, we want quality. I want questions. And I know I said it before a couple weeks ago. Those questions where the other two have to answer on behalf of the other one and the other one has to squirm and listen, that's funny. That's some good shit. That's good content. Yeah. Uh, I need to start reading the emails and picking better ones. You do? Because yeah. I'm picking them, and I'm picking, like, the weird ones. Yeah. Brian has a very particular taste in email, and I think it's very different to what Neve would pick, but I think that's also very different to what I would pick. Yes. This is the kind of email I pick. Sorry. Ask let's fight a boss at gmail.com. Ask let's fight a boss at gmail.com. This one is from Jamie. Least favorite parts of your favorite games. Hi, Neve, Brian, and John. I don't know why I'm really like. My question <laughs> is, what are your least favorite parts of your favorite games? Example, the entirety of the Mikalash boss fight from Bloodborne. Thanks, Jamie. Jamie, you're right. The Mikalash boss fight is... Uh, I kind of like the Mikalash. I like when he goes, Ho! <laughs> that is pretty funny. Um, his face... Sometimes he can glitch out and you can't find them. That, I think that actually happened to me the yeah. first time I fought him. Pain in the hole. Um, one off the top of my head is in Paper Mario Thousand Year Door, there's one chapter of that game where you were stranded on a desert island and there's a lot of fetch questing back and forth and it really breaks the momentum of that game. I have no memory of that. And <laughs> there's a funny gag and it's a funny gag but it's absolutely endurance humour where like Mario doesn't talk in this game, he's a silent protagonist. Uh, other NPCs talk to each other, but there's a mafia goon who needs to apologize to his fiance, and she says, "Apologize to me 100 times." 
he apologizes to her 100 times and you have to press the A button to advance the dialogue 100 times as he goes, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And that's funny. And then it stops being funny. Then it's funny again, but only in retrospect. <laughs> and it's quite frustrating. That's, uh, that's a really good answer to that. Yeah. Um, for me, it's near Automata and it's Route C and you're playing as 9S and you are towards the end of the game and you built up all this momentum and then you have to go through the towers and mm. there's one of the guard towers that is only hacking mini games, which are kind of frustrating if you weren't into the hacking part of it anyway. But with these hacking mini games, this and the hacking mini games are kind of like um, you, you're a little cursor moving around. They're shmups. Yeah, little shmups, and you have to like blow stuff up, stump stuff for explosive. The walls get magnetized in these, and they drag your cursor into the wall, and you you yeah. die instantly. I know the one. It's very frustrating. And you have to go back and do them all again. It's like super super frustrating, and it kind of sucks all the momentum out of it. Um, hated it. Absolutely hated it. I was really like frustrated. I finally found my rhythm with, with it and got through it to the point that when my girlfriend started playing and she got to that point and she was frustrated to shit, I was just like, I can do this for you. I can you can just hug this. the wall and you know all the sweet spots mm-hmm. where you're not going to get tugged in. Yeah. Yeah. What's a favorite game and what do you hate about it, John? Oh, let me see. I feel such glowing feelings for my favorite games. It's hard. There's a bit in Final Fantasy VII where to get Neo Behemoth, who's the fucking sickest summon, he's this giant behemoth with six wings that comes out from behind the moon and literally destroys the fucking earth to blow up your enemy. Um, You have to hit a random sequence of like triangle, X, circle and square in order to like get the code and you only have like 10 minutes to do it. But it's like, it's not, random like you can look up with the combination but i just i don't like doing that i don't know why but it's like as another character gives you clues as to what the code is but it's random so you might never get it and like i know like i have never not gotten it on my multiple playthroughs of that game and i've beaten that game like three or four times but i know other people who never get neo behemoth and i just think it's silly game design there's also a bit in yakuza Three, which is a game I kind of like, but as, a, as as like the Grand Yakuza Tapestry, there's just a really weird bit where you have to, no wait, this is Yakuza Zero actually, which is one of my favorite games ever, where you have to go to five different shops and that's the quest because you're looking for your buddy, but every time it's the wrong shop and he calls you and tells you a different shop. And it's not really that funny a gag and it doesn't help you learn the layout of Camera Ocho because that's that whole game. So yeah, that sucks. But by default, it's always going to be the fifth shop, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. So you just have to waste your time with the other four ones. And it's just it's just a kind of design that I just don't understand the logic of. Yeah. I got one more. Resident Evil 3 Remake. I liked all of that game except this one section where you have to go through a um, area and put all on a whole pile of generators and there's a face hugger yeah in that area and there's just a disgusting animation of that face hugger and jill that you have to watch that like it's like it happens to her anyway Mm -hmm. and anytime one of those characters like those enemies gets her you have to go through that animation again it's just a disgusting animation that seems out of step with everything else they've been doing with the remakes and seven and eight and i just absolutely hate replaying that game and have to go go through that one spot it just sucks yeah there's a silent there's a bit in silent hill 2 where you go off the map and you go into this area where there's just no map and i find navigation tricky enough as is stuff like that drives me insane Okay, I've got one more. Okay. I love Pokemon Gold and Silver. Whitney, the gym leader, with her milk tank that uses rollout. Fucking hate that boss battle. I I love that boss battle. Like, it's good once you know how to do it, but like, if you're trapped in rollout hell. To me, every Pokemon gym should be that. <laughs> <laughs> See, like, 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 that's like the only time I quit. I like I turn off my Game Boy and I'm like I'm doing this again and like that never happens usually I'll, like I'll just see it true or I'll like but that's just like if, if like for me if I'm like I made the wrong decision there's no way coming out of that 
the only way to do it is to, you know, avoid the rollout until you know you can take it. Uh, but if you're trapped in rollout hell, the only way is to quit out. And I just wish there was another option. Yeah. But it's just get a higher HP so you can endure it. That's a good email. Yeah. See? Who's that from? Jamie. Jamie. Thanks, Maybe, Jamie. Maybe we talk shit, but Brian didn't pick a good one. I think I started that one. Oh, shit. Just saying. <laughs> Fine. I'd love if someone else read the email so I've got one I've got another Brian, one here Brian if it helps every literally every week I'm like I should check the last one boss yeah you should I should I should and I mean to but the, I get distracted playing wrestling games okay I've got one here uh, someone else started this I didn't start this I know that for sure <laughs> what is this uh, it's from one of the people on our discord called Flaming Girl. Uh, I'm dying to find out. It's a good pun here because it is about dying our hair. Oh yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, so our names are rearranged. So any of your as Hemain, Dina, Nerb, Nodj, Dilre. Seems that's John. Yeah. <laughs> what color are you most interested in dyeing your hair next, or for the first time, if you've never? Sincerely, your daily dyer. Daily, your hair. That's a lot of work. Yeah, that's mad upkeep. Uh, you are by far. You dye your hair. Put it that way. Yeah. So yeah. that makes you the expert here. Well, I've naturally dark hair, so I would dye my hair like a dark brown anyway, because I am going so grey, just so fucking grey, so really? hard, so fast. Oh yeah, yeah, my temples. I'm like full silver fox in it. I, like I, I, all I my temples are grey as well. All the side of my hair. Grey, 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 grey. I've been going grey since 21. That's rough. I know. It's like that first animation job outside of college. I got like... <laughs> My first su- job. Super grey, super quick. <laughs> and a stomach ulcer. Uh, but like, so I would dye my hair kind of like dark brown anyway to cover up my greys. Um, and then I started bleaching it and dyeing it pink. And then I dyed it a cherry red and that was kind of nice. I um, thought the cherry red was super cool. I love yeah, it. Yeah, I'd probably go back to cherry red. Um, I wanted to do silver, but my hair just wasn't taking it. It just would not lose the bleachy kind of tones. And I tried every kind of silver shampoo and like... Were you just, doing it, it yourself or was this a hairdresser thing? Oh, I do it myself. The amount of money you spend to get your hair silver by so a hairdresser is... So I have is, been told. It mm. is crazy. It is bananas money. So my girlfriend does it for me. Um, I went back to brown because it was my dad's 60th and I could not have pink hair for that. I was at a family event recently and my dad was like, and cover up that tattoo. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I hear. Oh uh, yeah, my dad says stuff like that. I messaged him back and I was like, which one? And he messaged me back in angry sad face. <laughs> uh, what would you dye your hair, Brian? I dyed my hair one time. Yeah. In 2001. If you remember the date, you're so funny. It was a thing, I guess, like Irish lads used to do it, and I was one of those Irish lads. <gasps> they would dye their hair platinum blonde so they'd look like the real Slim Shady. Hell, Hell yeah. yeah. Um, I'll see if I can find a photograph. Not <sighs> now, but I have to go to a family wedding in in, in May. So <laughs> someone, someone in the audience sent me a reminder to try and dig up the photo, but there is a photo of me wearing sunglasses with platinum blonde hair. Sick. That sounds so fucking cool. And... <laughs> I remember at the time having the photo taken, I was like, this is going to look class. It's just a photo of like a 12 year old with hair. <laughs> it's just, it's just, it's the classes photo gone. Um, but I, I can remember all the lads would have hair like that. And I remember there was a couple of bold lads on my summer holidays and they were acting the bollocks and throwing paint at a boat. And a guy came over to me and went, there you are. And I was like, what? And he was like, you, you were throwing paint at the boat. And I was like, no, but I know who did it. Cause, <gasps> cause, did you rat them out, Brian? No, I was like, you got the wrong guy with the hair. Check over there. Ran away. Brian ride me out once. Really? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ran him out of work. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, oh I, God, actually spoke, why? I actually spoke to the guy about that because it was his leaving day and he was like, it was gone. What did you... Do I want to know? Cause... Do we want to tell this story, Brian? I didn't give a shit. So, Brian... So, ages ago, Brian... This is, this is in 2011. So, me, me and Brian had a period, I'd say, where we got each other jobs. Is that fair to say? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And Brian helped me get a job, I helped him get a job. And the way I helped Brian get a job is I was working at a place and they had a test. And he talked me through it. And I had interned there and I basically knew exactly how this guy liked his uh, 
like liked his, his like liked his things. His folder setup. <laughs> so anyway, and his layers. One named. day he calls us all around, and we're going through all. The, so so I get on I get on like a Skype call. I think it was actually a Skype call. It was uh, MSN. MSN. Sure, I get in a call with Brian. And I walk him through every single thing he needs to do in this test, right down to like the specific folder structure, <laughs> which was a mistake on our part, Brian. And um, we should have done with the other studio structure to be yeah, like, yeah, well, you should do it there. You should. <laughs> <laughs> so then, anyway, um, one day the team lead calls us all around and we start going and he just like for the laugh I guess takes us through like all these tests we're getting and some of them are really good, some of them are really bad, and we get to Brian's and he's like. This one's really good. A little too good. This is like perfect. And then there's a pause and he just goes, How does he know our folder structure? And I'm like, oh fuck. And I don't say anything. Because I don't like if I said anything, like generally I like to be a pretty straight shooter with this stuff. If I if I fuck up and I get caught, I'll just be like, yeah, that was me. You know, whatever. Doing that would cost Brian his job. And I don't want to fuck over Brian. So I don't say anything. So a couple of weeks later, Brian's coming in for his interview and I say to Brian, okay, Brian, whatever you do, do not mention me. Okay, don't mention me. Don't mention that you know me. Don't mention it because they're already suspicious. And Brian, you were literally like, I would never do that. Because like, you know, <laughs> you know, you were, you were, you were, you were excited to be interviewing and like you were happy that it gotten this far. And all. You that were interview like, went so well. I would never, ever do that. And so then anyway, Brian goes in. Half an hour later, I get a text message. Interview went really well. I told him it was you. <laughs> <laughs> and I got so mad and I was like, that little rat fuck. He was asking about you the other day, actually. Oh, yeah? Because the, the, I'm showing John a photo. Let me see. It's all that's left. Everyone in this photo looks great. Yeah. What'd you tell him? I was like, you know, I just copied John's homework for the test. And he was like, Oh, I know. Oh, I, I, we, me and him had a heart to heart about it. Yeah. We had to. And I was like, do you regret that? And he was like, nah, just look, at least you all behaved yourselves afterwards. Yeah. Do you know what? Never, qu never quite stopped being angry about that. You should. Because Brian, you never apologized. I'm very sorry, John. That's okay. We're all forgiven. I did a, I did a sneaky, I did a sneaky poo. Hey, look, it all, like, I'm not actually angry about it. It all worked out and you got a job that d lasted a long time. Yes. And we put lots of files on that media folder and we watched a bunch of documentaries. Oh, we, we had a lot of good times. <laughs> Do you remember that documentary about the people who dress as superheroes and hang out outside uh, that Chinese theater in that Hollywood? That was dark. That was very dark. That's a fucked up documentary. Yeah. It was a legendary media folder. It yeah. was. It I was introduced great. a lot of people to K-pop back in 2010. <laughs> that folder's gone now. Yeah. Got nuked. Oh, it had long gone. No, no, it? no. It got nuked like two weeks ago. It's fucking ridiculous. Wait, it was still going? Wow, that's crazy. And they got rid of, uh, they got rid of the user folders as well. And in my <gasps> user folder, you would go into my name and then you would go into a folder called extra and then you go into a folder called renders. And then you go into a folder called stuff and then you'd find like all the seasons of survivor that's the good <laughs> shit yeah. that's the good <laughs> shit but then if you like clicked on my username and checked the file size it'd be like 60 gigabytes and you'd be like what the fuck's going on in there but you would know where to find it what else oh oh the hair dyeing thing yes um i have never dyed my hair no in college you had like a blue tint Oh, I did have a blue tin. Yeah, oh yeah. God, your memory. Yeah, I re I would love to dye my hair like a silver or a kind of yeah, like I think a silvery or like an off white. I think if I do that, like, and it's it's such a shitty reason not to, but if I do that, the internet will freak the fuck out, and I just I don't want people's opinions on whether it looks good or bad or anything. It's my fucking hair, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's hair. It grows out. So I always think when it comes to hair, you should try it because you can change it. Yeah, I, I, I think if I will. If you hate it, I you think can I will. dye it back to brown. It will grow out really quickly because you have a short haircut. Like, uh, like, I'm cool with sticking with a haircut that feels weird for a little bit. Like, I don't mind that. It's just internet stuff. But that shouldn't, that's a bad reason not to do something. Yeah, absolutely. I was going through my favorites. Past Brian did me a favor. He took a photo of me with the fucking Slim Shady haircut. <gasps> <laughs> back in back in Christmas 2018. Can this just be the thumbnail? Nothing else. <laughs> Hell yeah! 
Yeah. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Oh my god, the glasses! That is the most. <laughs> they fell that in the is water. The peak early two thousands. <laughs> just okay, Neve. Love the design and the beautiful things you do for the thumbnail. Can it just be this? Yeah. Like the bad lighting. It's all so perfect. <laughs> I'm okay with it if Brian's okay with yeah, it. Yeah, no, I, I think someday if I ever drop an EP, that's going to be the fucking cover yeah, art. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, just, it's a moment in history of a 12-year-old boy who didn't know he was unironically amazing. We got one more? Yeah, we do, if I can find one. This low as I just didn't think. Uh, let's see. Uh, this one is from Adoin. Favorite Irish myths, mythical characters. I bring it up just because of um, You Are Not My Mother slash Ghostwire Tokyo and so on and so forth. Folklore. Uh, Dear Lara, Kirby and James Sutherland. Hell yeah. Uh, my significant other and I are also playing Shin Megami Tensei 5 and she really enjoyed seeing Mananan Gal since she's Filipino. Ah yeah. Um, and hearing you guys talk about her and other demons was really cool. Well, that leads to my question. What are your favorite myths and ways they have been represented? Thanks and cheers to the strongest video game podcast. And then uh, just a PS down here. Shout out to Oni and his wonderful editing. Hi. It's like he's there with every Kirby. Hi. Hi. Is that, yeah, he does that. Um, or other sounds added. Yeah, he's the Shadow Fourth member. For sure. He is, yeah. This guy fixes everything. Yep. All our goobers. No. Oh. We are constantly just saying our names and address on this podcast. Yes, just and Kavadi cuts them out. Yeah, mm -hmm. he, he undoxes us every time. Every time. I gotta say, as a Neve, I, I've always liked Neve of Tirna Nog. She doesn't do much in the story except say, "No, Oshin, don't go back to Ireland." <laughs> <laughs> um, she marries like uh, Oshin and brings Oshin to the land of Tirnanog and Oshin is all like oh I miss Ireland I really want to go back and then like he goes back to Ireland but 30 years has passed but she says you can go back for a visit but Oshin if you touch the ground of Ireland you can never come back to the land of the young because that's where Neve is the princess of or the queen I don't know and he helps men who are building a wall lift a slab up and the weight of the slab makes him fall off his horse. And once he touches the land of Ireland, he starts to age rapidly. Uh, well, what the fuck was he? Why would you try lift a wall on the back of a horse? I know, stupid. Bend your knees. <laughs> um, yeah. And he starts to age rapidly and he dies. And Neve is left in the land of the young, which they also said was filled with other women. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> mourning Oshin. <laughs> So she just lezzes off, is that what you're saying? Yeah, well that's my, my interpretation. Lezzes off into the sunset. <laughs> yeah. I always thought the children of Lear was pretty as well. Like that's where It's a lovely story. You know, they become, the kids become swans. Uh, I love the salmon and knowledge. I just think it's a simple story, but it's very good. Yeah, it's a pretty good one. Uh, on the way to Shannon Airport, they have a big giant statue of the salmon and knowledge. And I'd be like, there he is every time we go there. I just I I, I love the simplicity of it that like if like it's just really hard to catch salmon and the first person who takes a bite out of it gains its knowledge. And like that kind of reminds me of like the devil fruits in one piece. I think that's why I like it so much. Um, but it's like the, the master and the apprentice catch it. And while the master has his back turned, the apprentice is watching the fish being cooked and it like blisters in the fire and it like spatters onto his fingertip. And then he licks his fingertip because he got burnt. But in doing so, he gets the first taste of the salmon and knowledge and he gains the knowledge. I thought that was very good. That's pretty cool. I'm a big fan of the Banshee. My granny used to swear blind that she would hear a Banshee whenever someone was about to die. But then I once thought I heard a Banshee because I was sleeping in my room in the middle of the night and I just heard the most horrifying sound I have ever heard. And I was so terrified that I couldn't breathe. I was like, oh my God, oh my God, the old woman was right, oh Jesus. Now what I actually heard was just foxes screaming. Yeah, they have a very similar sound. Yeah, if you have never heard a fox like screaming in the night, it is not like a beautiful howl. It is like a thousand babies being strangled. <laughs> Jesus. It's, yeah. it's, it's a blood curdling wretch. It's really mm -hmm. terrifying. And um, I, I like banshees for that reason. Um, one more. My parents are telling me this before uh, because they would be my great grandparents. So I guess you have four sets of great-grandparents. 
Oh, I always thought about that. Because you got two grandparents, two two sets of grandparents, so then you would have four sets of great grandparents. I think in my head it always just went back into like <laughs> two great grandparents. It just it just reduces it. The over. family tree just curls back in on itself. Um, but my mom and dad were telling me that like each individual set, each individual pair, none of them would leave the house between midnight and one a.m. because of ghosts. That's class. And like that was a normal thing to do, and that was just sort of like a cultural tradition. You would not leave that. Like if you were visiting a friend's house and you ended up drinking and staying late, you would stay a bit later, but you wouldn't leave until after one o'clock. That's cool. You can't. If you leave drunk, the puka will pick you up and run you through some hedges. Yeah, he will. I don't want that. Yeah, I just thought that was very good. You know what I think is very good? Patreon shoutouts. Patreon.com forward slash LFAB. We already plugged it at the beginning. Eve. Yes. Why should people give a shit? Why would why would anyone fund a free podcast? That seems like the, the actions of a of a mad person. Uh, <laughs> I, I like to Neve, fund Neve, I can I can literally feel our Patreon donations <laughs> just plummeting. Dry. You have you have gotta pull us out of this nosedive. Like ten people have deleted their podcast. Just just generally, like my my feeling about let's fight a boss is always that it's something that you would download accidentally on LimeWire, and I think that's cool. <laughs> it's got a good vibe to it. <laughs> yeah. It's there on Kazaa. Yeah. You can give a dollar afterwards. It's like the pirate radio station that you actually kind of need to give money to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To keep going. Like we're real anti-capitalists, but at the same time, we, we all like to buy nice things. Yeah. I'll buy another video game that I won't play because I'll play Elden Ring instead. <laughs> yeah, it's a great feeling. <laughs> hey, we got to pay oh, those hosting fees. You just put it yeah. on the shelf and you're like, I'll get to this. Uh, it's a really good side hustle and we like doing it. <laughs> Brian, Neve, John, garbage people. Okay, you don't need to support us. Let me tell you about a little fella called Oni. A saint of a human. Deserves everything he gets. Uh, John, we don't pay him. Okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Shit. That's what those emails and invoices were. Oh, we we absolutely pay Oni and we really value the work he does. Yes, anybody who does music or art gets commissioned. Yeah. There mm-hmm. is an exchange of money. As someone who's tried to find podcasts to listen to online, a lot of them suck. And I don't think we suck too hard. So <laughs> we only suck a little bit. So if you want to keep something not sucking too hard, give yeah. to the Patreon. Thank you, Neve. That sure was... I hadn't anything prepared. You didn't... You do you think it. I you have things it. prepared? I'm, not... I'm off the fucking dome, Neve. I... I run on pure instinct, okay? I could fucking belt out a Patreon right... You want me to do it? You yeah. want me to do it? You want me to just fucking do it? 170 yeah, years you ago, have the natural there was a famine no, in Ireland. How many had times <laughs> Let's Fight a Boss has nearly turned to crime? I brought up robbing a bank a couple of episodes ago. You think I was fucking joking? No. I need more. You know what happens is the three of us rob a bank? We all go to fucking jail. You think we can record a podcast from jail? Well, we can, but it's a significantly lesser quality. Do you want that? No. Well, Brian can only to pay- fit one mic in his ass. Well, then- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have to use those like transparent electronics and they're cool but in prison they have them because they don't want people smuggling drugs in them. if you do not want to hear let's fight a boss recorded from within an asshole patreon.com forward slash lfab we want it out of the asshole there you go that's how you do an ad i tried the sincere route but like i don't know what i'm talking about I, do- i'm also doing the sincere route Neve. <laughs> you gotta do it sensational and covered in poo yeah. <laughs> I'm just talking into your butt. Before I got interrupted, I was just going to bring up the famine and make pe- people feel ga- bad about it, but you know. You know, that's also a good angle. Maybe we should go for that. Like, there uh, was a the famine. Irish people suffered an incredible atrocity. <laughs> they took their potatoes. Yeah, and I'm not going to say which foreigners, but you know who you are. Uh, this is the worst thing we've ever said. Um, shout outs. <laughs> this one is going to be from all of us. I've color coded it. Okay. It's from Nameless Dragon Rage, and this is. Absolutely something someone from the nameless would type. Nia, if you want to take this first one. Where's the beef? <laughs> Show me the money. Check, please. Classic. There we go. I feel better about myself. Uh, Nia, I also gave you this one. This is from Idris. 
What's he part of? The milk cult. That's oh, yeah. your cult, Neve. And can Neve say, I love you and I'm proud of you and I know you're going to do great. Uh, but in the most passive aggressive tone possible. Uh, <laughs> I love you. <laughs> no, that's the questioning. Uh, do it like dismissive. You like shake your head side to side as you say it. It'll help. Like, I love you. Okay, that's not. That's not what I'm <laughs> Imagine you're, you're saying like, it to a bad dog. I love you, and I am proud of you. But you shit on the floor <laughs> consistently. <laughs> no, he doesn't. He's a very good dog. He's shit on the floor. Um, I don't know how to say that passive aggressively. So just I know. I love you. That's and I'm not, proud of you. That's not passive aggressive. It is. So so the way you read it, like to me, it's like when I'm being weird about the emails and I'm like. I love you and I'm proud of you. I didn't know you're gonna do great. I don't think I've that's bored to me. This yeah. is hard. This is hard. Yeah, I saying mm. the words I love you and I'm proud of you is very hard. Like, because those are hard words to say. So I think it if, means a uh, lot. Yeah. So I think anyone saying them in any tone, you're kind of gonna take the, you're gonna take the words. Idris, is this what you wanted? Did you want to confuse our brains? Yeah. What about like, hmm? I love you. Hmm. I love you, and I'm proud of you, and I think you're gonna do great. That's oh, that felt weird. No, that I think that actually kind of worked. That made me feel kind of sad. That stung. Okay, yeah. okay. Let me, I'm going to say think, it like I'm saying it. But go, go. Okay. Oh, don't look at... Oh, we're making direct eye contact. I love you. And I'm proud of you. And I think you're going to do great. That felt kind of okay. That was sincere. because yeah. I was yeah, looking yeah. at you and I can't lie at you. Sincere. Oh, Neve. I guess I just love everyone. Idris, I love you too. I'm uh, proud of you. This has all resulted in a weirdly touching <laughs> moment. I don't know what to do now. But you know, you're going to do great. Uh, uh, <laughs> John, this next one's for you. Uh, shout out to John Walsh, and that's from Vito. Thank you, Vito. This was fun to read. Do you, do you have your full name out there? I guess, yeah, you do, don't you? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Many, many, many times over. This is from Deku. I double checked with him in advance. He said, I also double checked with him. Yeah. He was like, yeah, read that shit out, buddy. This is fuck-ass Deku, the weed cult bishop. So long, boobs. You won't be missed. Doing top surgery now. Wish me luck. So I I messaged Deku about this because I, I just wanted to ensure that there was some authentic- authenticity behind it and it wasn't funnin'. And Deku actually sent us this on the hospital bed before top surgery. Jesus. How yeah. fucking cool is that? He had and pretty metal. I will talk shit about Deku all day. I have gone on record as Deku being my least favorite person on that Discord. Him and his stupid fucking little Photoshop posse. That was a really good story. Uh, he, he typed that on the 4th of March, 2020. Dude, that's some good timing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hibby. No, wait, this is for you, Neve. This is from Hibby, seen Revivalism Zila. Stuffed crust pizza, but the crust is stuffed with mayonnaise. Oh my god. Mm, I could, yeah, I had eat yeah. that. Yeah. Jesus. Um, could John say. Okay. Like the gamers before me, the Dark Prince will rise up. Man, remember when I used to do the silly little Dark Prince thing? Who's that from? That's from um, Titanium. I think you should do that again. No, I kind of got a new, more authentic thing that I like. What is it? Uh, I'm the nameless king of this podcast. I'm pretty sure you're not. I'm pretty sure I am. Pretty sure. No one ever objected, so anyway. Uh, loot drop. Neve, you got loot? Uh, no, but I want to talk about the Neve, loot drop. Neve has had a lot of thoughts about the loot yeah, drop. Yeah, let's so talk about it. So the last time we, we podcast, um, I put up a poll on Twitter that says, should we call it loot drop? And, <laughs> and also asked in the comments and stuff like that. Yeah, and unanimously, people were like, do not cut loot drop. People get a lot out of loot drop. You see, my in my mind, no one actually clicked on the links okay but i know why this people is do click on because them. the links don't get a lot of likes yeah they but don't. they don't get likes because people just click on them because that's so. their engage i trust me and it's like you get eight likes on a link and you're just like i guess no one like why are we doing this but seemingly people have found a lot of their favorite youtubers and some things they really like from it and um our algorithms what we're being served is probably a little better what they're, they're being served currently um, so people really, really like it. So we're not going to get rid of it. But what we're going to do is we're only going to, if we have, we, if we don't have something to loot drop, we're not going to loot drop. Yeah. Yep. And we probably should have made that change a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I also asked if the logo was ugly and <laughs> the answers were yes, uh, no, yes, 
and yes don't change it and yes don't change it was kind of the highest one so I, okay i like there's the another, honesty there's another nuance to this if you poll people on twitter and you give them a decisive answer two decisive answers and an in between the answer i have never seen a poll where the in between the answer didn't win yeah it's very difficult to like yeah, have a hard line on it if you can go somewhere in the middle. We weren't going to ever change the logo anyway. I just want, I was just like, I just wanted to know how people just felt. just to see those those numbers. Yeah, you just don't know. You do things in a bubble for seven years. You don't know how people feel about things. The guy who originally said the logo sucked came back to tell me it did suck ass. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, dude. Class. <laughs> Still going. Yeah. How many, how long, how much, how much a space of time was in between those two interactions? Like a, like a year or two. <laughs> like, absolutely. He came out of the woodwork to just be like, no, to, to con- reconfirm uh, it's shit. <laughs> Stands by those words. We don't, uh, we don't need a new logo because I feel like if we change it, we'll like die instantly. It is, it is just part of what we are. Yeah. I like it. I really like in it. In terms of other logos for podcasts on like Spotify, it doesn't suck too hard. No. I love it. I wouldn't change a thing, yeah. except for Lutrop, where we, it's going to be optional. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I got so ages ago on this podcast. I think maybe multiple years, probably. But um, I recommended a podcast called Dead Eyes that I found weirdly fascinating, and that is about this actor who many years ago auditioned for the Band of Brothers, only for, and he got the part. Then was told that he had to re-edition for the part that he had already gotten, but he had to do it in front of Tom Hanks. Oh, yes, yes. yes. And Tom Hanks told... And Tom and he did the re-audition with Tom Hanks, left the room, and was then told by a person that he has dead eyes and that Tom Hanks didn't want to work with him. I think dead eyes is kind of fascinating because you can tell it is this person who is really pathetically obsessed with this one moment in their lives... I didn't listen to all of Dead Eyes because after a point, I kind of, I kind of got the point. I was like, okay, he's really he's he cannot let this go. But it was like funny and weird as well. Like I liked that about it. The final episode of Dead Eyes has released, and it's just called Tom. He got Tom Hanks. He got Tom Hanks. Nice. Does Tom Hanks remember? No. Absolutely, of course he doesn't. Tom he's Hanks, a busy man. Tom Hanks doesn't remember. But the episode is about as satisfying as it could be. Like I feel like yeah. he gets an answer and he understands what happens. Because like I know I know someone like Tom is going to be fairly accommodating and yeah. and honest and chill and friendly about it. Yeah, his son Colin told him about the podcast. Colin's a cool guy. Colin's a cool guy. He's in Fargo season one. And they just have a really good conversation about the nature of the film industry. And Tom Hanks comes across as just a very likable man. And um, I don't know. I started this arc a couple of years ago and it felt good to close that loop. Yeah, I'd like to too. There's some episodes that are really good. I really like the one with John Hamm. Oh God, John Hamm is so charming and funny. It's not Mm -hmm. fair. And Amy Mann. Yeah. That was a great episode. But yeah, good podcast. Yeah, it's good. Sometimes I listen to it and I'm like, fucking buddy, move on. Yeah, oh, absolutely. But I mean, that's kind of the charm of it. (laughs) Yeah. It's got dead eyes. Um, I actually have a loot drop. Tom Hanks says he has lovely eyes. <gasps> he was lying. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, this channel is called Patrick CC, and I've been watching um, a few of his videos. They're really, um, they're pretty good. But the one that got me watching was a sad one. It was the downward spiral of Bam Margera. Oh, and, we, I watched that the yeah. other day as well. Oh. And why he was fired from Jackass. And this just made me really sad as a fan of Jackass and CKY and BAM. And it's just like, this is stuff I knew because I have, I follow his Instagram and I spent one really sad night after Brian told me he wasn't doing too yeah, well. Yeah, he fights the fans on it. Yeah, like just going through his Instagram and you could just like see everything happening because he's just consistently documenting his downs really, really thoroughly and it was just like super 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 sad and this video just like basically puts all of that in a timeline and and that that was it and kind of gave context for a lot of stuff that was happening where you could kind of see it but you didn't really know 
This sounds really sad. I'm absolutely going to watch this. Oh yeah, it's, yeah. It's, 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 it's really a sad. But um, Patrick C.C. Uh, his he he he's a nice chill way of presenting information, and I've watched a few of his other videos um, since then. But yeah, give it a go. Uh, mine is a YouTube channel called Stuff We Play, and it's a one-hour video on Pokemon Live, which is the four kids entertainment version of Pokemon as a Broadway show. And it's the making of. And what? Did behind, this happen? Yeah. And they did a tour of it around the east coast of North America that and part of Canada. And they were doing like four shows a day. Oh, wow. And uh, Andrew Reynolds, who's who was in Book of Mormon, played James. <laughs> That's <laughs> insane. I did not know this existed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's really good. There's interviews over video call with some of the people who are in it. Um, there's like a lot of like archived footage, but then there's also lots of like missing footage. And it seems to be kind of like a good mix of like, this is what's out there, but it's going to be a, a case of like this video getting traction and then more stuff being discovered about it. Sure. How did they do Pokemon? Was it just people in costume? Some of it's in costume, some of it, yeah. Some of them are like models that are just on like gurneys or on okay. like, they, like they wheel them in and wheel them out. Some of them are people in black suits uh, moving Pokemon arms and stuff mm. like that. But it seems like everyone in that show was playing up to like, like three or four different roles because whenever they weren't playing a human they were playing a pokemon cool brian what's our hour count three hours two minutes oh jesus now there's there's gonna be some humming and hawing because we have to find uh like stuff but let's just say it's a clean three hours it's a big boy but hey you have to wait an extra week got there's next... 20 extra minutes <laughs> yeah you got a fat one out of it you got a fat one that's episode 162 162 will there be any ep- episode 163 I don't know. I'm going to say probably not. But maybe. Bye, everyone. I love you. Bye. Bye.